Hi, everyone. Well, so welcome to another discussion, interview, q and I'm not sure quite what, this time with my longtime friend, Terry Sanofsky, who is uh, most famous for being kind of an originator of the whole computational neuroscience movement. And I guess, um, uh, I don't know, I was trying to figure out, when did we first meet? It must be 1984, 1985, something like that. Does that seem it, it was, uh, that's right, your early 80s. Um... I, I think were you, were you I, at the institute back then? Yeah, that sounds plausible. I might have been at an institute in Princeton. I think that I was uh, trying to get a sort of institute for complexity theory oh, started. You were trying right. to get an institute right. for neural computation exactly. started. Now it's all coming back, right? Right now, but you, I did get my complexity institute started, but I bailed out of that whole thing, and you got your institute for neural computation started, and you've been doing that uh, all this time and building all kinds of things there. That's right. Uh, the Institute for No Computation uh, was founded in 1989 at UCSD, and it's been going strong. So, you know, as far as I, you know, when I first met you, you were already talking about neural networks. So I, from, you know, in my sort of model of you, you were kind of born doing neural networks. But how, how did you get started in that whole, whole line of thinking? Well, uh, it actually goes back to my graduate career. Um, so I was at Princeton in the physics department, uh, and um, I was working at the time with John Wheeler, who was a uh, you know black hole fame, uh, a very 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 uh, influential physicist, uh, as, as you well know, Stephen. But yeah, yeah, right. I mean, his 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 ideas are um, you know famous for the kind of it from bit. You know, right. can the whole world be made from computation and so on? Although he didn't really talk about computation, did he, very much? I mean, he was, did he ever use a computer? Do you know? I've never seen him. Uh, in fact, it was, it was mimeo, mimeograph days. He would, he would write his lectures out and mimeograph them and pass them out to the class. So it was uh, definitely pre-computer. Um, but did but, he know about, did he think about Turing machines and things like that? Did he know about Turing machines? You know, I can't remember, uh, but I think you, you're right that his, but he, he kind of, you know, he had an idea of, of bits, which means that he had yes. an idea of, of digits, the digital computing, but he, it wasn't part of his DNA, right? Mm -hmm. Which was more aimed toward understanding dynamics. Right. And of, of course, you know, general relativity is the area he was really working on at the time. That was his... Uh, yeah, that you know, before that it was uh, nuclear physics and and uh, fission uh, with Niels Bohr. So you know he had a very broad career, uh, and in fact the project I was working on with him at the time was on black holes, and and the question was you know what would happen if there was a black hole. He gave me this at my first day in his in his office, right, his lab. He said, Terry, what would happen if there's a black hole in the middle of a galaxy? So I went off and I did some computing, you know, I did some simulations and sure enough, it turns out that because of the wind down, because of gravitational radiation, um, it, would, it would be torn apart and it would form an accretion disk. And it's exactly, you know, what it seemed to me a, a huge source of energy that would then power things like quasi-stellar sources, QSOs, which at the time were a big mystery. And so that was my introduction to uh, you know, John, John Wheeler's uh, vision, he was looking around for ways if black holes existed. And at the time, it was just a mathematical oddity. You know, where would you look for them? And what would, uh, what would it look like? So when was this? What, what year was this? Oh, my goodness, that, that goes back to the early 70s. So that um, was before like Hawking radiation, and things like that. The Hawking yes. radiation is still in the future. Yeah, that's right. Hawking radiation was at least five, 10 years in the future. Um, but in any case, uh, what, what really uh, I think was seminal was th that uh, my next project was uh, how would you detect gravitational waves? And, and, and there was a tremendous amount of excitement at the time because Joe Weber, if, if you remember that era. I remember that whole business, yes. Right. Uh, the, had, aluminum had, discs, had, the aluminum it, cylinders. Right, a big aluminum cylinder, you know, about 10 feet long, uh, instrument with piezoelectric transducers which allowed him to look at vibrations kilohertz vibrations and and he had a 
article on Fizzarev letters, uh, which uh, had evidence for you know, simultaneous detection at uh, College Park in Maryland and at Argonne, you know, two of these bars. And, and the, the coincidence was, you know, otherwise it would just be, there's all kinds of uh, background right. noise. You know, it, you're, you're trying to measure distances a fraction of the size of the hydrogen atom, right? So this is really pushing it. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, so I started working on theory and I figured this is gonna be great for my thesis. You know, this is, uh, so what I did was I said, what kind of sources? Again, this is John Wheeler, right? You know, where is the signal coming from? And so I went through every single possible source, supernovae. Uh, I, I looked at, you know, black hole collisions and I looked at, uh, you know, anything that you have, you have to require an enormous amount of energy to, to be able to get a signal because if, these are very, very, very weak, right? And, uh, and, and I calculated that he was like three orders of magnitude away from any known signal, from any known object that could possibly be responsible. And, and then the curtains came down when he discovered that there was a bug in his program, his analysis program. <laughs> and in fact, oh, is that what happened? Okay. Yeah. In, fa in fact, you know, there, the, he, my, I was right. There is no physical object. And in fact, the, uh, it, it was, and I, 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 so I was very dispirited. I sat down and made an estimate. How long would it be before uh, anyone would be able to detect these waves? And I, I, I first of all, I, I zeroed in on interferometric uh, methods because that, that would have much higher sensitivity. Of course, you know, it would require a huge interferometer. And I figured, well, order of magnitude per a decade well, that's about three decades or 30 years. And so I figured I, I don't have, you know, in 30 years, I'll be an old man. <laughs> I wanted to do something that had impact. And at about the same time, I was taking courses from uh, biologists, uh, in, in particular, Mark Kanishi, who was studying barn owls at the time, sound localization. And I was just mesmerized because here was, a problem which was as mysterious as the universe, which was how do brains work, and you know how how do we d generate uh, this incredible ability to think and to see and all all you know it, it, it was a big mystery still is by the way. Right, but so, so I'm curious. Coming back to something you, you mentioned when you were doing sort of the black hole in the center of the galaxy type thing that you were actually computing like with a computer. What what um. Uh, how did you get into, I mean, was that like Fortran and cards or was that, um, uh, what was the, um, uh, how yes, did you okay. get into Yes, okay, I had decks of cards. Yeah. And, right. and I, you're absolutely right. There was a computer center and I had to take my decks of cards and then I would come back the next day and I would have my printout, literally, you know, line printers. Yeah, yeah, right. I started okay, doing then. computing when that was how things worked as well. Right, because, and you know, it, it was slow going, but you know, and it, 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 by today's standards, these computers were really sluggish, right? It was right. like, and of course, this idea, you know, who would think that one would have like a centralized computer? I mean, why doesn't everybody have their own computer? Well, now, of course, we have cloud computing, which is back to the old idea again. But well, um, it, it, you know, it, so actually, I I've, I've thought a lot about this. And if you look at any complex system, and this is some it'd be your business, uh, you, you need layered systems where you have local edge devices like we have, you know, smartphones, but then you need something which uh, aggregates that information. And then uh, eventually you'll, you'll have a cloud, right? But, uh, but, you know, there are many layers in between. And that's the way the, by the way, the brain works. The brain is a layered system, has, has many, many uh, components that have to interact at many different scales. Well, we should talk about that. I, I want to hear about what, um, I mean, for me, it's kind of like we understand neurons, we understand something about kind of collective views of how thought works. And I'm sort of curious what's in between, but I think that's, I think that's, a, that's a bigger story. And the, but let, let's, go, let's go back to the historical narrative because I'm curious. Okay, so we're at barn owls and- um, Right, uh, okay, back- but What back. made you start taking a class about barn owls? Um, you know, it was, it was a uh, kind of a curiosity. You know, what, what I wanted, I just wanted to know what other people knew. And 
<laughs> I have to tell you about how, okay, this is another story I haven't ever told anybody. Uh, so all uh, second year students have to take a general exam at Princeton, graduate students in physics. And it was a grueling one week marathon where you take tests in the morning, three hour tests in the morning and afternoon in every area of physics, right? right? Classical mechanics, electricity and magnetism, nuclear physics, general relativity, solid state, they call it solid state physics back then and now condensed matter physics. And, you know, and then at the end you had to defend a, an experiment. And, and so I measured the three gamma decay of positronium. Okay. Okay. So you had to know all the physics in your head at the same time, right? And so the, 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 more, the, the summer before uh, I took the exam uh, was, uh, you know, people leave Princeton because it gets hot and muggy, but I was up in the, my, my office, it wasn't an office, it was a big area in the, in the attic of uh, Palmer Lab. And, uh, and, and this was a, you know, it's just sitting and, and going over physics was, was really grueling. So I, I would, I would uh, go to the library and dabble in things that might be interesting to, you know, to distract me. And I came across a series of, of, of uh, there, were, there were transcribed meetings called the Hosea Macy conferences. And it brought together some luminaries from many different fields, including Norbert Wiener, uh, Warren McCulloch, Margaret Mead, uh, you know, uh, Ralph Gerard. I mean, these were people from psychiatry and anthropology and, you know, it was uh, cybernetics. It was a very, very elite group. And, you know, and it was exciting because, you know, one meeting after the next, you know, they, they seemed to be getting deeper into this whole idea of uh, nonlinear feedback systems and, uh, and how that could be applied to society as well as to understanding how people behaved. And, and then, you know, I was really excited. Uh, you know, this is, wow, this is, this is so exciting, right? I mean, you can imagine uh, the, the eavesdropping. They just basically transcribed word for word what people were saying. You know? Yeah, these, <laughs> these, you know, Terry, these, those, those transcripts were recently republished because I think it must have been, what is it? The, I don't know what anniversary, the 70 something anniversary? Because those things were in the 1950s, right. mid 1950s. Yeah, mid 19, exactly. And I remember the day that I finished the last volume and it, it, that was it, that was it. So I, so I was saying, you know, you know this is, you know, this seventies now. So, you know, there's 20 years, what, what, you know, I wanted to know what has happened since then. Uh -huh. And so I, I started you know, going to the library and looking up a few papers and, 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 and I, I formulated a question. Okay, a very naive question, I said, is the brain a deterministic system like a digital computer or is it stochastic? Uh -huh. You know, where there's a wide, you know, the signals are fluctuating all the time uh, in, in, a, in a highly uh, variable way. And, uh, and so, you know, I couldn't, if you look at papers and nobody ever directly answers that because you know, nobody was asking that question you know, is it, a, and so I just went, I went to the biology building, Gil Hall, and I just walked into a random lab, literally. And, and I asked. Not, not, I, your, your brain not being stochastic. There was nothing in the, in the choice of random lab. There was no stochastic. <laughs> well, you know, maybe yeah. our lives are stochastic, but you know, I want to know how the brain works. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. So, so I asked the person, first person I met, and uh, it turned out it was actually a technician. And also I didn't know at the time, but I know now is that it was a fly lab studying fruit flies. And I even know the person, Chip Quinn, whose lab it was, but he wasn't there. And, and you know, I'm talking to technician. I didn't know at the time, I just, somebody in the lab. And, and she said, well, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can tell you where you can go to look. Uh, and there's a, he said, she said that there's a paper by Hubel and Weasel. Okay. And, and uh, published in Journal of Physiology. And sure enough, I went, I, I found the paper, 60, 1962 is a classic paper, it was the first recordings from primary visual cortex. 
And because it was the first, they had raw recordings. And it was obvious to me it was not a digital computer just by looking at the recordings. Right, right. But so, so I mean, in, in terms of that tradition, right? I mean, von Neumann had talked about, you know, unreliable components and how you might be able to get reliable computation from unreliable components. But I, the cybernetics people had, had uh, I mean, this, this question was not certainly a central one to them. But okay, but so Hubel and Weasel, um, now I know you've, you've, by now you must have done endless actual recordings from brain cells and things, but at the, what, was the, what was the technology that made it possible for Hubel and Weasel to start doing single cell recording? You know, that's a great question because all advances, as you know, in science, follow new tools and techniques that are available to record something you couldn't before. And interestingly, I learned this much later, uh, David Hubel had actually invented a microelectrode, which made it possible to record from single neurons. So this was an era when, you, you know, typically you put in a piece of wire and you, and you record from thousands of neurons simultaneously, it's called hash or EEG from the scalp, which was even averaging over millions of neurons. But, you know, that doesn't really give you the grain that you need. And, and so he invented the tungsten microelectrode. He was able to isolate spikes coming from single neurons. And, and he, with Torsten Weasel, discovered that individual cortical neurons in, in primary visual cortex were, had a tuning curve that were selective for a particular stimulus and, and in particular bars and edges in a particular patch of the visual field and were topographically organized. This, I'd like to say, uh, this was the recording that launched a thousand microelectrodes into not just the visual cortex, but the entire brain. Right. And it was really exciting because, you know, we're seeing the, the actual granularity of, of what, the, what, what the brain was computing, individual neurons. That's the unit of, this is a cell, the, the unit of, of, of all organs. And it was very heterogeneous and very different areas have different uh, stimulus features, auditory cortex, motor cortex for uh, activating muscles. So, it, you know, it was a golden era, you know, for about 20, 30 years. Now here's, here's the, the limitation that we now know looking back, okay. And it, it was that kind of, I, I lived this, so I, I, I was part of the whole process. Uh, and, Here's the problem. There are about 100 billion neurons in your brain. By the way, that's, a, that's about the same number of stars as there are in the Milky Way galaxy. So this is like it's right. It's also the number. It's also in, in terms of, of knowing numbers. It's also the number of galaxies in the universe. So we're 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 very scaled in that way. Yes. Yes. Scale free. Okay. So here we go. <laughs> and. The, uh, here's the problem. Uh, what, what is it like to record from one neuron at a time? Well, first of all, if you're, it's gonna take a long time to record from all those neurons, right? But it's worse, it's worse. Because here's an analogy. Suppose someone gave you an image and suppose you had no concept of what an image is. You know, you don't have eyes, but you have an instrument that allows you to record the intensity of a pixel, one pixel. Right. And let's say this, it's a megapixel, right? Right. A million pixels. So you, one at a time, you have a chance to, and, and now, okay, so you, you sample the distributions and you do your statistics and you get an idea that there's a, a signal out there, but you really can't quite make it out because it's even worse because it's a movie. It's always changing, right? <laughs> so how far are you going to get, right? You're, you're, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 actually a tribute to the fact that we made progress with this really crude technique recording from a neuron time. And, and you know, we have, a, a gives you a crude idea, but it just shows you what the challenge is. You, you have to be able to record from many neurons at the same time. And now we're there. It, it took, you know, 30, 40 years. And by the way, the picture, the conceptual framework now has changed radically. Um, well, so let, let's let's go back a little bit to the the. I mean, so you know, the visual cortex turns out topographically laid out at least in the first few layers. Auditory cortex, motor cortex, those things. I mean, I, I guess we'll talk about later 
kind of every other area of the brain and how much we can understand about what's actually going on there, because I think it's a different, somewhat different story. Um, but, but I mean, back, back to your kind of um, journey with the Hubel and Weasel and barn owls. And um, so right. at, at some point, so when, I mean, Hubel and Weasel, were they thinking about McCulloch Pitt's neural nets or did they not know or care about that? Uh, interesting, that's very interesting. And uh, I never actually did a postdoc uh, in his department and I talked with him about many things and never asked him that question. But I know that one of the papers that was very influential in that period was uh, by McCulloch Pitts Letvin called What a Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain. Right. And, and what that the paper uh, introduced was the concept of a feature that the, bot the business of the brain is to pick out features from the sensory stream and to represent them. In the case of the fly's retina, it was a, it re the cells upstream responded to a small black speck that was moving. <laughs> so this is great for catching flies, right? So, so that was the that was that was the zeitgeist at the time. So I think that it, Hubel probably was influenced by it, and uh, and try to take that to the next level, which is you know what are the features that the visual cortex represents, and and they, it did a great job. Right. So, so I'm curious, coming back actually to Wheeler for a second, because you know one of the things that Wheeler talked a lot about was in the kind of it from bit, you know the the observer as an important part of the the sort of feedback loop of the universe and all these kinds of things very kind of uh, sort of almost brain-like in the kind of, you know, bringing brains into physics and so on. Did you ever talk to him about that stuff? Oh yeah, yeah, we talked all the time about it. You know, he, he, he was extremely uh, passionate uh, and, and it was all tied up in his, uh, by the way, you know, we're, we're talking about the Planck length. <laughs> All, he, he thought all this foam was going on, you know, well, well, well below the level that even, of elementary particles, right? This is like, you know, he was going way beyond experiments here. But I remember it once in the middle of, I, I'm not sure if it was a, a lecture. I think it was a lecture he was giving. That's right. He was giving a lecture on it from bit. And he drew a picture of a big U, the letter U, right, right. like this. And then out of the side of one of the, uh, the, the ascending uh, lines of the U, he had a little pocket coming out, right? A little pocket, which was like an eye. And he said, that little out pocket is you. <laughs> it's, it's your retina looking out at the rest of the universe. Uh-huh. And, and so he, he, one of his geniuses was being able to put abstract ideas into a very concrete form that anybody could understand, right? That, that you know, immediately you say, you say, ah, I get it. I see what's going on. Well, except that that particular set of ideas didn't, you know, that was something which didn't really until very recent times get, um, get worked through. I mean, that, that was the... You know, the, the universe observing itself and second order cybernetics and all these kinds of things was a... Right. Well, was not you know, Wheeler at the time was... That part of his research was considered kind of loony. Well, <clears throat> that's putting it too strongly. It was, it was not mainstream and, and nobody quite knew what to make of it. You know, because they, they were he was very highly respected and, you know, awarded and so forth. But... But, you know, he really went out on a limb. He really, you know, he figured that, you know, I really want to understand how this works. And, you know, so he dug deep, you know, into general relativity and he was digging down deep into the fabric of space time. By right. the way, one of, one of the most important influences on me when I was an undergraduate was reading a book that he wrote called Space Time Physics, which was yeah. actually mainly about special relativity, but it, it, it again, it, it captured the way that he graphically illustrated things having to do with how space and time get interchanged. Right. Which is yeah, something I, I know I, you're working I, on now. The thing that drove me crazy about that book was, was people with poles running through barns at significant fractions of the speed of light, because I could never <laughs> figure out what idealizations one was actually making in thinking about those kinds of uh, sort of large scale things in, in those terms. The, it, it's some, um, 
But but I'm I'm curious in um, uh, you know I know Wheeler. One of the things he did was talk about this geometrodynamics, this kind of idea of very oh, yes, wow. The, and I, you know, that's something that is quite resonates with our current physics project. The only right. downer for me was I knew that Wheeler had written a book about geometrodynamics. I'd never seen it. It's referenced in the Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler gravitation book, but I'd never seen that book. Okay, I, I think I may have a copy of it because I remember reading it. Okay, so I got that book. Oh, and you I think the it? reason okay. that I, the one has never seen it is because that book uh, posits that gravitons are neutrinos. Well, you know, is people can make mistakes. Yes. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, it's a great book. It has well, a lot know, of very I, good I ideas. Could, I, if he had asked me, I would have told him it was wrong because gravitons, as you know, uh, they're spin two, right? Neutrinos are not spin two. Indeed. But, the... You know, uh, you, you, you know the, well, what, what was in the book were things like wormholes, right? Yes. Which now, you know, is, is kind of, very, but by, by the way, okay, I have to, I have to finish my story about gravitational waves. Okay, so this is, so I, actually, I was really dispirited, you know, I figured it was gonna take 30 years. And so that's why I started going and looking more care, you know, looking into what's happening in the brain and biology. But along the way, I figured I, I should publish this, what I've done. And so I did, it was an article in, in, in physics today, back in the 70s. And, uh, <clears throat> and I called up Kip Thorne, another Wheeler student. Uh -huh. And I said, well, what do you make of this, Kip? You know, this uh, Joe Weber's uh, looks like it's not really uh, going to pan out. What do you think? And he said, well, uh, t t Terry, I look forward to the time, perhaps <clears throat> eight years from now, when we discover for the first time gravitational waves coming from uh, supernovae in the Virgo cluster of galaxies, the nearest cluster. And I said, can I quote you? So I, that, that quote is in my paper, right? I mean, I, I just took it and I just said, oh, is this, you, this is what you, you know, your, your, your prediction, okay? <laughs> so, so it's only wrong by half an order of magnitude or something, is a, a factor of five or something in time. So, so you'll, you'll, you'll be amused by this. So in, I've forgotten when it was 2015 or 16 when the, the uh, announcement was made. <clears throat> so I sent him an email congratulating him and I, I sent him this quote. I said, you may not remember this, but you know, here, here, you, here's what you said. And, and his, he, he came back immediately, which was strange because he probably had been inundated with thousands and thousands of emails. Somehow he remembered me. <clears throat> I said, Terry, I was wrong about the Virgo cluster of galaxies, but you know, what's the difference between eight years and 30 years on a cosmic time scale? <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> So in any case, that was, I, I figured that, look, I climbed to the summit of physics I, I, and all the problems that were left were so difficult that they probably wouldn't be attacked in my lifetime very, without new instruments. And, and if you look around in, in terms of what was available in general relativity, it was pretty pathetic. Right. So it's and a little right. ironic coming on to later in the story that in the deep learning business, there was another 30 year span when it wasn't clear what was going to happen, but uh, it's so. Uh, okay, okay, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Okay. Yeah, right, but it's okay. So we're, we're back in, in uh, Hubel and Weasel and sort of the influence of, of McCulloch and Pitts through Letvin and so on in, um, in those kinds of things. But, but so, uh, you know, you were, you were doing black holes and gravitational radiation, gravitational waves. And then what, when did you, you, you switched at some point to doing more officially neuroscience kinds of things? Well, I, I made a fateful decision, which was to take a summer course at, at uh, the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, very famous for biologists. It's a kind of a mecca where, you know, uh, people come from many different places in the world and spend uh, their summer courses where they, you come for, uh, you know, weeks, uh, months in some cases, and uh, for, for introducing people into fields, uh, parts of biology. And also people would set up labs. They would have labs and they'd come and work all summer. And, you know, there were marine creatures. You can, for example, one of the most celebrated uh, species in neuroscience is the squid, because the, the giant axon of the squid was used by uh, Hodgkin and Huxley, another important team, 
And they were the ones who discovered the mechanism for propagation of the action potential, right? They were able to figure out the molecular mechanisms. And so, so did that not need that that didn't need a microelectrode to get to the giant axon of the squid? Oh, what they did, it's really interesting. It's it's giant, it's a millimeter uh, a diameter, and most neurons in the brain are like a micron or in some cases. Why does a squid have that big an axon? Oh, it's for escape response. It has to has to have a very fast escape, and it doesn't have myelin, which means it doesn't have a sheath, the, the insulation. So it basically the bigger the diameter, the faster the action potential gets to the muscle. And, and, and it gives and it squirts out black ink and it, it starts, uh, it actually is a jet propulsion. It, it, ex, ex, you know, ex, 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 it puts out a squirt of water. So, uh, so it, in any case, yeah, so people came there to do experiments on squid. Uh, that was one of the labs that uh, was there. But in any case, I took a course in neurobiology and it was 11 weeks long. It was the most intense period in my life. I think I only averaged like, you know, five or six hours of sleep because there was something new happening every day. It was really exciting. I recorded for my first uh, neuron in, in the lab. You know, I can see the action potentials. Actually, it wasn't a neuron. It was a muscle, but they also have action potentials uh, much bigger mm -hmm. than the neuron. Uh, <clears throat> I, I did a uh, electron microscopy project, uh, which was to do free fractures uh, imaging of a skate electroreceptor. Electroreceptors are found in sharks, for example, and, and, and rays. And, and, and they can detect very, very weak electrical signals that's equivalent to a one and a half volt battery across the Atlantic Ocean, just to show you how sensitive they are. And I wanted to see what was in them. <laughs> and it was eventually published, actually, because no one had ever done it before. But the, 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 the beauty, though, is that this was a hands-on course where basically you, you, you could really uh, get, and, and, and the instructors were all from Harvard Medical School. By the way, you're, you're talking about the electroreceptors of, of sharks and so on. You know, the, the thing you were saying about uh, vision and images and just looking one pixel at a time and trying to find a uh, kind of an overall framework for thinking about images, one wonders with things like electroreceptors, what is the overall framework that a shark might have to describe you know, what's going on? Uh, you know, that, that's a great question. And I'll, there's been a lot of work on that. One of the things we know is that by uh, the shark can actually figure out where it's heading by uh, the V cross B with the magnetic field. Velocity cross the magnetic field gives it a signal that allows it to orient. So it has a, uh, just like we have a sense of vision, it has a sense of the magnetic field around it, which allows it to navigate, which is, you know, amazing. But so, so for example, there must be feature detectors that you can find for the electroreceptors. So just like we know yes. we, we recognize edges and things like that. What do you recognize in electro space? Okay, okay, so this is, this when I first came here to San Diego, uh, Walter Heilergenberg, who was uh, at the uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography down the road here, uh, was doing exactly that. He recorded from different stages in the, in the brain. This is electric fish. Now, it's not a shark, but it's electric fish. They also have electroreceptors. And, and, and it turns out that he was studying something called the jamming avoidance response, which is how do you prevent your electroreceptors from getting overloaded by your own electro reception, because they can put out their own electric field. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So it's not only at passive, they, they actively create electric fields and they can use it to hunt for food, for example, and conspecifics and communication, very sophisticated. So, so yeah, so the, the, that, uh, you know, he found signals that were uh, able to, to allow the electric fish to compute the, all of those things. <clears throat> So, okay, we're but, but going going back. We're we're still in barn owls here, pretty much. But we're um. So you you were oh actually we're, we're talking about uh, uh, Cold Spring Harbor and no no Marine Biological Lab. Which yeah, is Woods Hole. Woods Hole. Woods Hole. Yeah. That's different. Um, that's a different. Uh, yeah, that it's on a different peninsula. <laughs> It's a, yeah, that's right. Uh, it's in a different <laughs> state, and it's a, 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 a you know the uh, MBL also has Hui, uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, which is one of the major- right. It's where they send actual bathosphere Oceanographic, down to... yeah. 
Right. But okay, so so um uh so you had a chance to actually do hands-on work on actually uh studying, you know, doing actual neurobiological experiments. Did they, did they also have theoretical courses there? I mean, were they talking about kind of what was known about McCulloch Pitt's neural nets and perceptrons and things oh, like this? Okay, so let me let me give you the the context for this, okay. So I, I was doing something that was so out of the ordinary. You know, I was going from theoretical physics, stepping into a lab, and I don't think anybody else was doing it at the time. Uh, there, were, there were a few isolated people around the world that were doing neural modeling, but it was very formal mathematical work. It, it, it had very little contact, little contact with biology. It was all, you know, simple analytic models that, that you know, weren't very realistic, but, you know, but, and uh, the, the biggest meeting, national meeting is of the Society for Neuroscience takes place annually and <clears throat> 30,000 people show up. And as far, and, you know, I went to these, again, it was, you know, kind of a, a, a it was a, 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 an experience to see so many people studying so many different aspects of the brain, so many different levels, you know, all the way from ion channels up to psychiatry. I mean, this is like, and I went and tried to seek out the computational posters, right? There's like tens of thousands of posters, literally a sea of posters a mile long, one or two. <laughs> you know, this, this is a very empirical field. There was almost no sense or tradition except for a few of these isolated papers. McCulloch and Pitts was a very, and, and, you know, and, and I actually wrote a, a bio, a, it, was a, it was an article, it was a biography of McCulloch um, that I wrote a review for. And, and I, 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 I thought about this and, and it was clear that, that, that when he died and uh, that was the end of an era and when Lepton, you know, he, th those were kind of way ahead of their time, way ahead of their time, you know, in terms of developing Network models. And they had some very sophisticated network models for invariance, for example, way before convolutional neural networks. They, they understood that. So but there had been a tradition. I mean, perceptrons were a thing, sort of a, a simple mathematical sort of uh, uh, simplification of, of McCulloch Pitts networks. And then people were making practical, sort of simple neural nets for things like optical character recognition back in the 1950s and 1960s and so on. But I think that yeah, was kind of an engineering tradition, probably separate from the biology. It, it, it was, it, it was, and it was, I think, also ahead of its time, as you know. Yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, be that as it may, it, 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 the reality was that I was stepping into a foreign land and I had to learn a foreign vocabulary in fact, it was not just the, the words, it was the conceptual framework. Okay, now let me give you an example, it's just to give you a feeling for what the difference is, okay? So physicists, uh, when, they, when they do an experiment, say on an electron in, uh, at SLAC, uh -huh. it's the same electron that someone is studying somewhere in Russia, right? It's, they're all the same. So we think. Well, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> it may actually be the same electron, you know, going one, going backwards and forwards. And I think that was that was the Feynman Wheeler idea. I think that one didn't pan out. But no, um, I, I I'm just being facetious here. But the, the 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 difference I'm trying to make is that they're similar enough so that you can reproduce experiments right. very easily. It's not the case in biology. Every individual is different. Right, that's that's the whole idea of diversity of, of uh, you know genome. Right, but uh, every cell is different, even in, in you know neighboring cells in the same organ, they're different and they're being regulated differently, and and so that means that you know you, it's really hard to get an idea, uh, to get a general principle out of the heterogeneity. It, it's extremely and, and so you have to think differently. You don't, you can't just. By the way, Leo Szilard, uh, another great physicist. Uh, decided to go into biology toward the end of his life. And he said that uh, it, 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 it changed his entire lifestyle. And, and why was that? He said that, well, one of the things I love to do when I was working on a physics problem was to get a hot bath and just soak in it while I was thinking of ideas from first principles in physics. 
He said that when I switched to biology, I would have to get out of the bathtub every couple of minutes to look up a fact. <laughs> it's like interesting because so much of biology is history. It's not just principles. It's it's historical accidents that different species came up out of different times and different circumstances. And 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 you know there there are regularities that you see. Like DNA was the big discovery that that really changed all of biology. Uh, but you know there that was a far and few between. But so so we, let's we should talk about this more about you know to what extent brains are generic and what they do and to what extent it matters what the details of each individual neuron are and so on. But let's go, going back to kind of your uh, your narrative so to speak. So okay, so you discovered that there are no computational neuroscientists basically. Yeah yeah. So so basically I you know just I decided that gee you know this I'm going if I'm in this you know, for a long haul, I'm, I'm good. I really wanted to uh, uh, be able to think like a biologist. And, and so, uh, and, and there was, there was a, a remark, I was, I was incredibly lucky my whole career. I, I had one lucky break after another. So, uh, so I was working on, uh, after the course had ended, I stayed on for another couple of weeks at Woods Hole in, in <clears throat> taking electron micrographs of this gay electro receptor because uh, nobody had ever done this before. So I, I was going to publish it, right? I was going to get a lot of nice, beautiful figures. And so I'm in the basement of LURB, the biology building there, one of the biology buildings and in, in the, the EM room, which is lights are out and so forth. And I hear a phone ringing outside and there's nobody else around. So I go out, I pick up the phone, say hello. And and, and, and the person at the other end said, hello, is this Terry Sienofsky? <laughs> I said, yeah. yes. He said, well, my name is Stephen Kuffler. And, uh, and, and it, 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 as it turns out, all of the instructors were from his department. He, he started the neurobiology department at Harvard back in the 60s. And, uh, and he said, I heard from them that you did a great job. And, you know, I was re really impressed with you. And I, I have an opening for a postdoc. And are you interested in working with me? <laughs> this is the father of modern neurobiology calling me up, right? <laughs> okay, very nice. And so, yeah, uh, so once I got, you know, I got back, I had to get my things in order. So the next year I uh, went up and worked with him. And, and that changed my life because not only was I getting an introduction to neuroscience, but at the highest level, I, and I, you know, this was a department where Hubel and Weasel were doing their experiments and they were former postdocs with Steve. And, you know, uh, and, and, you know. Uh, what, was, what, was, what was his great kind of contribution to neuroscience? What was his big- Oh, thing? okay, okay, so many, many, so he, was he had a genius for actually coming up with the, the right uh, preparation. That, that means that experiment, uh, the species and the measurement to answer an important question. Uh, things like, you know, how does a synapse work? Uh, and, and, you know, different types of synapses, uh, or for example, uh, and here's a typical thing he'd do. He'd say, you know, these, there are these glial cells, the asterisk, the, these are cells that uh, wrap around neurons and, and uh, provide glue between them, but they have many other functions. And, and let's, let's explore them. So the, the, he, this, he found that leech had these giant glial cells. So he and uh, one of his uh, postdocs, John Nichols, went in and, and answered uh, some simple questions. And, that, and, then, and so he said, well, why don't you take this, John, and, and, you know, and explore it? So he made a career out of it. He would do that over and over again. He would, you know, crayfish uh, stretch receptors. I mean, he just went over and over again. And, and let, me, let me give you one example in vision. So he was, uh, his first job was at the Wilmer Eye Institute, which is the Department of Ophthalmology at Johns Hopkins. Right, by the way, I got my first job at Johns Hopkins. So I, <laughs> he's a legend there. Uh, and, you know, he's a synaptic physiologist. And so he felt guilty. He wasn't working on the visual system. So he, he looked at, uh, you know, found out what was done and then he realized that no one had ever recorded from a single ganglion cell in the retina that projects into the brain in vivo, in, 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 in an awake animal. Uh, 
or you know, living animal. And, and so he devised an electrode system where he can put an electrode into the retina at the, and record from a single ganglion cell. Again, very, at the time, is a state of the art, the, the, you know, the one neuron. At, while he shined a little spot of light around and, and he worked out the response properties and shown that, uh, that they were circularly symmetric, that there was a small region where you can get an excitatory response when the light goes on and then around it was an inhibitory region where you actually reduce the response. And when the light goes off, it's an off response, you get a burst of spike. So this is this on center off surround and, and then the inverse is now in all the textbooks because that turns out to be universal in all vertebrates. So this is, right. you know, he, he did this classic, but then he just moved on, right? He, he, and by the way, he said to, his postdocs, Hubel and Weasel, in, you know, at Hopkins said, look, why don't you follow this up, find out where the ganglion cell goes, record up there and tell me what you find. <laughs> and so this set them off on the journey to get a Nobel Prize back in 1980, while I was there, by the way. I, I was actually in the department when it was announced and it was like 1980, 81. So, so I'm curious, just, a, just a, a sort of curiosity thing, when you say, Leeches have big glial cells. You know, squids have giant axons. Right. Does somebody have, is there like an inventory somewhere of, you know, is it like location scouting for a movie? You know, you say, I want to find a creature that has something or other. Oh, no, is no, 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 no. Uh, it, it's, oh, okay. There isn't a book you can go to, but there is a vast literature. Biologists, they, they're great stamp collectors. They love to go out and just find out what's out there. And, you know, and that's the important, you have to do that to get started, right? Just to get started. And, and I'll give you one classic example from uh, Sidney Brenner, who was another giant, you know, with uh, coeval with, with uh, uh, <laughs> and discoverer of mRNA, which is a famous thing these yeah, days. Yeah, that was that he did that with uh, when he was uh, at uh, the LMB, the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, when uh, during the golden period in Cambridge, you know, when DNA was discovered and uh, RNA and so forth. That the, that this is the the, the what do they call it the it was not a principle they called it a dogma <laughs> right you know dna rna proteins okay so and 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 this is uh at a time when you know what do you do for a follow-up you know <laughs> what what do you do next and so uh, all of these famous now famous people at the time were just casting around for a new project and so so sydney decides he wants a small animal which has a small number of neurons. And so he went through a vast variety of different uh, species and went through the, the, the very obscure literature, came up with a nematode. It's, it's a roundworm that has 300 neurons. But it, right. it's, it's able to survive. It's, it has locomotion. It does all kinds of interesting behaviors. You know, it, it's uh, in the soil. It, it, it eats bacteria. And, and, and that created a whole field. And now there right. are hundreds, you know, people studying C. elegans. Why? Because it's po it was possible to get the entire uh, lineage of each neuron. In other words, uh, as, as the neurons divide, as, as the cell, the neuroblasts di divide, you can follow the fate, where they end up and what are they, well, their function. Every cell altogether, of the whatever, 17. Every, every cell in the entire nematode, but specifically, uh, Sidney was interested in the brain. And then he did something which is really remarkable. In 68, he teamed up with some electron microscopists. And what they did is they serially sections about a millimeter long. And what they did is traced every single neuron and they named every single neuron. And that was with the first connectome, which is now a big deal, right? People are trying to do the same thing for mouse brains. Has it actually been done for anything other than the C. elegans? Yes, okay, it was recently done for two other species. Uh, one of them is the fly brain. Which has about 100,000 neurons, and another one is the uh, zebrafish. So it's, it's, it's is the very, fly brain like the like the C. elegans? Is it repeatable? Does every fly have the same connection? Ah, uh, you know, th th so it so it turns out that it's not true even for C. elegans. There's there is some variability in, at the synaptic level. Yeah, the the the, the, the neurons are more or less uh, you know fixed, but how they connect up is still variable. And the same thing I think is true of the fly brain, although I, I, you know, I don't think they've really done more than one or two so far. So it's hard, it's right. too early to say, but 
but it, it, it's uh, remarkably stereotyped. Uh, remarkably stereotyped. You know, and we're sure perverse. that our human brains aren't. No. <laughs> the only thing we know is that, it, that the number of neurons, see, see what happens is that uh, during development, you, 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 you get these uh, uh, progenitor cells that keep dividing. And, and, and they, in each area, right? So they're creating new, new, more and more like the cortex, right? You keep creating more and more cortex and then they stop. Now, the point at which they stop is regulated by a transcription factor. And that is variable from species to species. In fact, you know, in individual to individual, that's the whole point. And, and you know, you create more cortex, you know, you have more capabilities, right? So, so that's the difference is that is larger numbers and it's, it's not, they, they're still the same, by the way, in the cortex, the same neurons in all cortical areas. It's just, and they're, they're, but they're not exactly wired up exactly the same. There's, there's differences, there's subtle differences in the ion channels and the neurons and so forth. But nonetheless, uh, there's a lot of, of, of similarity. So, so it's, 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 it's a variation on a theme, uh, but actually at, one of the big surprises in biology has been that now that we have the, the genetic blueprint for how you construct a brain, it turns out there's an amazing similarity between invertebrate brains and vertebrate brains. Just to give an example, Hox genes, which is part of a, what's called the homeobox genes, uh, which are responsible for segmentation. And it's true whether you're a fly or whether you're a human, right? Mm -hmm. And similarly, a lot of the neurons that are, uh, that are developed in, in flies and in, in, uh, in, in vertebrates also have similar backgrounds uh, in terms of their, uh, their, 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 the, the genes that are turned on and off and how they specialize and so forth. So there's a tremendous uh, amount of, of similarity, but also a tremendous amount of, of, of refinement. So the very same ion channel will get duplicated over and over again and then become uh, specialized in different neurons in different parts of the brain. Interesting. So, so, okay, back to, so, so now you're at Harvard in the neurobiology group and doing, right. and, and were you, were you at that time, were you doing experiments or were you, were you, had you, could you justify kind of going computational at that point? I did experiments every day. In fact, I took a vow of chastity. I would not touch a computer. <laughs> the okay. reason was <laughs> so wait a minute. This is this is when this must be 1979 ish. 19, yeah, 89? 79, 80, 81. Yeah. Okay, so that was right yeah. when computers could be when you could like start hugging your computer. So yes, yeah, you know the, the, the lab computers gotten cheap enough so that and and they were coming in. They were at, in the department, and I was I for I said I'm not going to become a programmer for these guys. Right, I'm not here to program their computers. I am here to learn from them. And that means whatever they whatever they know and do, I want to do it too. And so I was very fortunate. Steve Kupfler was a hands-on guy. And he, in fact, the, we, we studied something called the bullfrog sympathetic ganglion, which is part of the autonomic nervous system. It's important for in the bullfrog for secreting secretions, you know, in the periphery. Uh, and, you know, in, in, in our, uh, in our system, the sympathetic system is, is important for regulating uh, functions having to do with relaxation on one hand and then alertness and getting you all pumped up on the other hand. And in any case, so these, 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 these neurons, he picked them out because they were huge and they were round, um, makes them simpler to record from. <laughs> and I studied a synaptic, uh, a, 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 a particular synaptic communication system uh, between the spinal cord and this ganglion cell, which was outside the brain, which so, had so I have to ask you, sorry, the, the, you know, you mentioned bullfrogs and things. And again, we didn't finish on the question of, you know, when somebody found the bullfrog, were they like going through a bunch of natural history books and so on and saying, hey, has anybody got a, a, um, a creature with a round neuron? Let's go see whether, <laughs> you know, we can find one. I mean, what, what's the... Uh, you know, I, I wish I had asked Steve that because, you know, that would, that's a great question. That's a really great question. How, how did you come across? Typically what happens, I can tell you because I've been on in discussions, is that uh, people, there are people out there who are like catalogs. 
who have this all in their head. They, they know that, that they, 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 they know all the butterflies. So they, they know all the, all the roundworms. And so if you're interested in something, you go and you talk with them. Okay. Yeah, and that's what you know. You find out is that they'll tell you that they know about particular s- specializations and specific types of, of of species and so forth. So that that I my guess is that that's how it happens. It's through word of mouth. Otherwise, it would be hopeless, right? To to have to uh, sit in the library. Which but, organisms? I'm just curious. Which, which organisms have been your favorite organisms? Ah, uh, okay. Forget the humans. Well, forget the humans. We're, we're, uh, okay. I. You know, you know, I it, it's a, it's it depends on what the question is, and uh, I, I I I you know, one of the beauties of biology is is as I said that the diversity of, of the you know incredible behaviors, like you know the barn owl is an amazingly specialized creature for sound localization, much better than we are, and it uses it for hunting mice in the dark, with echolocation. Right. It can hear the rustle. So, you know, uh, and so if, if you t- ask me about, you know, <clears throat> my au- the auditory animal of all time, I would say it's the barn owl, right? And, um, and then, but if, if you talk about, okay, this particular synapse I studied, right? I spent a couple of years at it. <clears throat> Most synapses in, in our brains, uh, the time scale is a millisecond, right? Very fast. Well, uh-huh. by, by, by biology standards, obviously by computer standards, it's this really slowpoke, right? As we're talking about, you know, nanoseconds versus milliseconds, right? Factors per million. But this synapse that I studied, the time scale was measured in minutes. Hmm. In other words, <clears throat> we would sit there, we'd stimulate the nerve, the electrode is in the cell, we're doing a bulge clamp experiment. It would take 10 seconds, but slowly you see the membrane potential starting to go up. And at that point, you go out and get a cup of coffee. You come back a minute later, and it's just reaching the peak. <laughs> a minute later, okay. And then you've got to wait ten minutes for it to come back to baseline. And and what was what made this really amazing was that unlike all the other neurotransmitters that I was familiar with, which which were very small molecules like acetylcholine and norepinephrine and serotonin, I mean these are all uh, biogenic amines. This was a peptide. Uh, LHRH, which is a decapeptide, 10 amino acids. And it was the same peptide that's found in your brain, right? In, in the hypothalamus. Uh, so it releases luteinizing hormone, it's a reproductive hormone. So here was, here's this reproductive hormone sitting in a bullfrog sympathetic ganglion that's responsible for regulating the activity of this neuron over timescales of minutes which of course is the time scale of the bullfrog is probably interacting with the environment. You know, it's, 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 it's a chill sense. animal of some kind. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, every species has a different niche, but what, what's amazing now is we know that there are hundreds and hundreds of peptides in your brain and we only know their function of a few of them. And, and, you know, very likely they have a very, and, and there's receptors for those peptides, G, the, the G protein coupled receptors, which are extremely numerous and found and they're, they're, they're very, very slow. They're, they're slow because they involve what's called second messengers inside the neuron compared to this millisecond stuff, right? So is there, I mean, do you guess that they're to do with the autonomic nervous system or are they to do with emotional responses or are they, what are they to do with? Uh, Yeah, I, I, I hesitate to speculate uh, because the, the, there's probably so many different functions, first of all. But very, very likely, it, my guess is that it has something to do with homeostatic balance. So, you, so you've, you've, the, 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 the brain plays with fire. And, and by that, I mean positive feedback loops. And engineering, they're an anathema. You want to stay away from those. You, it's all, it's all you know, negative feedback. That's how you do control. And, and, but, but it turns out with positive feedback, things are much snappier, faster, and, and you, you can compute much, much, much more sophisticated uh, types of transformations. And, and so there's all this positive feedback between the pyramidal cells, excitatory positive feedback, and, and just maintaining a balance to making sure it doesn't, it, it doesn't uh, go off the deep end. 
you have inhibitory cells that obviously are in the loop, but also, you know, the, the whole th it has to be really, there, there, there's uh, many different inhibitory cells and they all have to be re regulated in a different way. So my guess is that in order to maintain that balance without a lot of epilepsy, which, you know, is, is when things go wrong, uh, re requires a very, very sophisticated systems for, for maintaining balance on timescales of, of, you know, many seconds and minutes, which is, I think, what the timescale these peptides are working on. But one feature of epilepsy is it, it, it becomes a global effect across many, many neurons. So, but the, is that, um, I mean, is the idea that somehow you have to regulate things locally to prevent something becoming a, a spreading effect to those across many neurons? Well, so I, it turns out you're talking to the right person. I work on epilepsy, okay. models of epilepsy, and I collaborate with people who study epilepsy in humans. And the first thing that you discover when you start digging into it is that there are many, 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 many different types of epilepsy. Just the same, this is the same, you know, broken record that I've been telling you about. Uh, and there is, there is localized epilepsy and there is generalized epilepsy and you're referring to the generalized sort. And so the real goal uh, in epilepsy is to try to control that. And to some extent you can do that with drugs that block specific ion channels. Mm -hmm. uh, and the drugs are, are really, the, you know, themselves cause problems, uh, side effects. But you know, at least it, it, it reduces it, the epilepsy, the, the, the seizures that are, can be very debilitating. Uh, I collaborate with a group at Mass General that puts in grids of electrodes and records for several weeks <clears throat> looking for the focus of the seizure. Where does it start? And, and spread from there. And uh, these are people who are, uh, are, you know, don't respond to drugs, are right? intractable. Uh, and, and the only uh, hope for them is to find this, the focus and then to go in surgically and remove it. And so, but in the meantime, I have access to literally uh, 20, you know, set, set 24 seven for weeks of recording. And so I, I initially got interested because I was interested in sleep and sleep states in humans. And i made an important discovery there about something called sleep spindles. But then I got, we got, we had all this epilepsy, all these seizures that were occurring. And so we said, let's start studying those. And so now the, the latest paper we had, we've actually figured out how to, how to detect the <clears throat> change in the state that happens hours before the seizure occurs. So we can predict when the seizure is going to occur. So and how it has to do these neuron arrays? How, how many neurons are they recording from? Oh, and the, these grids are really crude. They're on the order of, uh, you know, centimeter, but they're the surface of the cortex. So you have a very high res spatial resolution compared but how to- How many pixels? How many pixels are there in the-, in the, in the Oh, oh so it's a, like uh, a couple hundred. And each, and there, each one is sensing how many neurons typically? Oh, each one is actually uh, recording averages over probably 100,000 neurons. So okay. it's, it's a very crude, it's a very crude way so to it, see it, but- it's one step up from EEG, but it's not single cell recording. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and there are whole new uh, uh, technologies now for being able to do the single cells from large parts of the brain, these neuropixels that a single, uh, uh, that with uh, VLSI technology can record from a thousand neurons. So you can record now tens, uh, 50,000 neurons in dozens of parts of the brain simultaneously. So the, the technology is coming along really, really fast. So, you know, I want to come back to the narrative, but I don't want to miss, uh, what is a sleep spindle? Okay. So when you fall asleep, your brain goes through different stages of sleep. Uh, and and it, it alternates between what's called deep slow wave sleep, which is the restorative sleep. You, and you go into that immediately after you fall asleep. You stay there for about an hour, but then you come up and you have these uh, uh, dream states. They're called rapid eye movement or REM states. And you go back and forth during the night spending more and more time in REM and less and less in slow wave sleep. But it turns out that in between the two, your, your, your brain spends about half its time in the intermediate level of sleep, which has been very mysterious and has been not studied as well, uh, the stage two. And it's when these spindles occur. So a sleep spindle is a very highly synchronous state of when many neurons are spiking simultaneously in bursts uh, in both uh, the, the cortex and also in the, the area that projects to it. 
called the thalamus. And there's a there's feedback connection, so they, they're synchronous. And they last for about two seconds. They're uh, 10 to 14 hertz uh, bursts. And uh, and it was thought, that, and this is, I collaborated with uh, Mircea Steriad for, he, he records from single neurons in the cortex during sleep spindle. So I, literally, uh, we, we published many papers together. And and from, you know, recording from just a handful of, of, of neurons, uh, he could record in three at the same time, intracellularly. Uh, he, he, he said that they are synchronous across the whole cortex. The whole cortex is spindling at the same time. And so I assume that was true. Well, now with these electrode arrays that cover literally like you know, the one hemisphere, uh, what we were able to show is that it's not perfectly synchronous, but rather uh, there's a traveling wave. It's a circular traveling wave that goes around once every cycle about, you know, literally about 100 milliseconds per cycle. And um, it, it's a mystery. What, why is it doing that? Uh, and we, you know, we were challenged because, you know, this is, these are epilepsy patients, so maybe there's something wrong with their cortex. Uh, but then we went and recorded from babies and they have, they sleep half the time and they have beautiful spindles, huge spindles, and they're all traveling ways. So it's, it's almost like this, you know, a brush cleaning the brain and it's going around every, every hundred milliseconds. It, it's actually the, the, the uh, behavioral evidence suggests that the sleep spindles are really important for consolidating memory. So your experiences during the day are kind of hooked into the hippocampus and during the night, the hippocampus replays those experiences into the cortex and it sets off the spindles, which are thought to be like kneading the bread and, and putting the experience into long-term semantic memory. What is the, the word spindle? What does the word spindle? I, I mean, I sort of imagined it's a physical object, but what, what it, is yeah, the word I, spindle? You know, I, I looked into that and I think it goes back to the, the, the your days when people were spinning yarn, you know, and, and making clothes. Well, yes, I've, I've heard of those kinds of spindles, but what is well, that? I, 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 so, so the, the, the <laughs> So I think that the, the idea though, that they, they have something that, that bursts and is repetitive and, and it, it looks like a spindle, you know, uh, when you record from it, it looks like there's, uh, that's the, that, that, that's the, the, the farthest okay, side. Very confusing. But so it's, 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 a, it's an action, it's not a thing. It's, a, it's a, a process. Yeah, it's a process, it's a dynamical process. And in fact, I, I wrote a whole book on this. It's a, you know, a 600 page book, a monograph of Cambridge. Uh, oh, Oxford, Oxford, actually. And we know the biophysical mechanisms. We can reproduce models, detailed models of the, the ion channels and the connectivity. And it, it's a beautiful, this sleep, these spindles are the most, the best studied brain oscillation. There are many of them, but the, the, the best studied, the, the one that has the, the, the best, I think, uh, understanding, both in terms of molecular mechanisms and also potentially what their function might be. But so, I mean, in our traditional, you know, usually in our EEG, we'll have, I don't know, the alpha rhythm or something like this, which is, is that also a traveling wave going around the brain or is that? Yeah, something well, okay. Well, well, so now in retrospect, so again, uh, if you go back to what I said earlier about, you know, trying to record from one neuron, you know, how limited you are, you'll never see a traveling wave recording from one neuron at a time. Never. You'll never see it. And so when people record oscillations from one electrode, they, they, they don't know. In fact, most people you know, who were studying oscillations, it never even occurred to them. You know, they, they didn't have any way of, of visualizing the array. But now, and I have a review paper on this, uh, dozens and dozens of oscillations at frequencies that vary from two hertz all the way up to 100 hertz, they're all traveling waves. What makes them different is the spatial extent to which the traveling wave goes. And I have a paper uh, uh, which I collaborated with here in, uh, in last year in Nature with uh, uh, you know, colleagues here who record from visual cortex, John Reynolds. And we showed that uh, if, you, if you ask a monkey to detect a weak stimulus, a spot of light at threshold so that they're only getting it 50% of the time, you can show that whether or not they see it depends on the phase of the traveling wave going through that location oh, wow. in the cortex. In other words, when it's favorable, when, when it causes the cell to go depolarize, to go near a threshold, closer to a threshold, the monkey will see it. 
But if it goes in the opposite direction, monkey will not see it. Showing that there's a direct behavioral impact. Hmm. Well, so so let, let's see. We we were we're still. Let's go back to the narrative of of um. Uh, this is this is interesting. But but let's so the the when Harvard studying bullfrogs. Um, right. Then then what happened next? Okay. So the second lucky break, and this is an, I like I said, my whole life was a sequence of these. I came across, you know, a invitation. It was an announcement that there's going to be a meeting uh, in San Diego uh, on neural modeling. And so I replied, you know, I said, I'm a physicist. I'm working here at Harvard Neurobiology, uh, recording from neurons. And, uh, oh, I, I, I guess I failed to mention that uh, <laughs> There, there's a little chapter in between Wheeler. So I did my master's degree at Wheeler, but eventually I got, because of the fact that I got sidetracked in biology, I ended up working with John Hopfield. And my thesis was actually on analyzing uh, nonlinear models, uh, network models. So, <clears throat> so that was before. So, so, I mean, I ran into John Hopfield back in probably 1981 or so at Caltech when he was right. working on the you know, the Hopfield model of, of simple neural networks. And so That's on. right. Yeah, famous 82 paper. No, this is when he was at Princeton. He was still a biophysicist and, uh, you know, condensed matter working uh, and, and, and making a transition, going to meetings uh, that were organized, you know, for people to come in from the outside and uh, the, the NRP, it's, it's a neural research program. Uh, and, and he would come back and we talk about what was going on. So, and I ended up, writing a couple of very abstract uh, network papers. That was my thesis. But so, so he had been, John Hopfield had been a sort of traditional condensed matter physicist. Yes. Working on spin networks and things. That spin, That's spin right. Systems and things like right. that. Um, and, and then, but so the, the, the things you did about what you're calling network theory, is that, does that mean kind of, um, you know, what graphs do, or does that mean something about you've got this array of, of neuron-like spins or what was, what was the kind yeah, of- Yeah, no, uh, uh, so, you know, he, this is like in a, before the Hopfield net. Um, and, and so what I, was, what I was doing was taking existing network models that people had proposed. Uh, there was a famous one by David Marr and Tommy Poggio for Seriopsis. And I just said, try to analyze it. I said, you know, what, what are the, you know, attractors and what, what was the uh, dynamics and so forth. And, um, and I, you know, I, I, can't, I, I did, a sto I, ironically, a stochastic analysis. And I showed that if you look at the correlations, it's simplified because the correlation structure under some reasonable assumptions could be analyzed analytically. But so in those days, I mean, as I recall, like interacting with John Hopfield back in 1981 and so on, you know, attractors, were not yet a thing he was talking about. That came from dynamical systems theory, which was still quite separate from the kinds of things he was thinking. Yeah, you know, I didn't call them attractors either. I just called them solutions. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, I, I had the right idea and I had, and I had some, I, some ideas that were way ahead of their time and now are just becoming, uh, you know, amenable to experiment. But so, that was, that was that was before I took the course at Woods Hole, right? This is but, my. But so were these still continuous calculus type systems, or were these more digital, digitalized kinds of systems? Oh no, this for my thesis was totally uh, theoretical, and there was I did not do any simulations. It was all uh, analytic, and I, with, I, I used I used calculus. a lot of nonlinear analysis and so forth. Fair enough. But okay, so so all right, so now we're back to we're still in bullfrogs, um, right? Well, that was that that was the okay the moment when I I, I uh, answered this um, meeting, uh, the, this this announcement of the meeting, saying that <clears throat> I'm really interested. I've got this background in neural network modeling, but I'm doing experiments, and they, they, you know I didn't know anybody at the time, you know who was the Personally, I didn't know anybody, all the people doing these, these network models, I had read their papers. And so I showed up, they, they invited me and I showed up 1979 here in San Diego, it was uh, UCSD. And so this is where I met Jeffrey Hinton. 
was a postdoc at the time, you know, just like me. I was a postdoc and, and he, he was coming from psychology and AI. And he was convinced that these network models, at the time they were simple associative memory models, you know, so it was, wasn't advanced, you know, hot field nets. It was more kind of uh, linear so stuff. Who, who had organized the meeting in San Diego? It, it was uh, Jeff Hinton and uh, let's see, there was someone from Brown, uh, Jim, I've forgotten who it was, but in any, any case, uh, Jim Anderson. So these these were these were, you know and, and these 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 are true believers these are these and, and they invited probably half the, the the important people who were doing network modeling at the time uh, and, and this included you know Theo Vokohonens from from Finland and, and Stu Geeman from Brown uh, a statistician. But these um, these all had very different. I mean, like like uh, the the Gemmons or whatever they had some particular kind of modeling approach. And there were, I mean, at that time, it seemed like there were, there were at least 10 different, you know, completely different types of modeling that were, right. were going on. Right, right. Okay, so in my book, The Deep Learning Revolution, I, I try to... See, look at this, I, 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 I'm I tried to, Here we there go. You go. There, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the shout out. Uh, <laughs> but it, I have a chapter where I talk about what it was like being at that point and I said that everybody was working on a different kind of a model in isolation with very little crosstalk between them. But they only had one thing in common, that none of these models could solve a difficult problem. <laughs> in other words, there was right. a disconnect there. And I and and I and Jeff and, and the meeting that he organized and just bringing the people together was really uh, almost unprecedented. It was, you know, it was just the, you know, for people listening to them, each other, and you know what they thought, it was more than just you know, the and, and it was uh, actually a paper, uh, it, it was uh, papers from that meeting or chapter book chapters came out. Parallel models of social memory was published just a couple of years later, and it's really fun to go back and look at what people were thinking back then because that 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 was very telling. And and I summarized my thesis basically in that, in that chapter. But so did that turn into what became the parallel distributed processing business? Yes, or? yes. So so it turned out that Jeff was kind of the seed for two very well established psychologists at the time, uh, David Rummelhart and uh, Jay McClellan, who were in the psychology department. See, look at this. I'm I'm all prepared. That's the that's the that's okay. The that's book. it. I have a, a a couple chapters in that book. Yes. Uh huh. So uh, so Jeff and I have a chapter on the Bolton machine. So we basically hit it off. We basically both had the same. Uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, intuition that, you know, look, the only existence proof that any of these problems in AI can be solved is the fact that nature has solved them. So why not look into the brain? It is, you know, you got to learn something here. You know, we're going to figure out the algorithms. We're going to figure out something. And so, you know, we had this simple minded idea that if we looked at networks of various sorts, we could probably make progress. But the, the real roadblock, as you know, in the perceptron was that <clears throat> you couldn't go beyond one layer of weights. If you're trying to train up a network using gradient descent, you're stuck because as soon as you put in another layer, you have these hidden units and who knows how you're gonna train the, 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 the weights, the, the synapses below them, you know, the features, figure out what the features are that you need. And in any case, Jeff and I figured out how to do that with, with in, interestingly, I mean, we, we, it, was, it was a marriage made in heaven because he had these great insights from psychology I had this, the tools from physics, right? The full armamentarium. And, you know, we took, you know, the math we took from statistical mechanics, Boltzmann distributions, right? That's what we call the Boltzmann machine. And lo and behold, there was a learning algorithm for these Boltzmann machines, which allowed you to get past this, this uh, barrier that, you know, that the field could not get past, which is how do you do a multi-layer perceptron? We, we figured it out. But so... So how did that relate? I mean, simulated annealing had been a thing that was was already being talked about, or that was a. Was you know, Scott Kirkpatrick published his paper. In fact, in fact, this is this is this is the origin of the Boltzmann chain. Okay, Jeff and I were at a meeting in Rochester, and Hopfield was giving a talk on the Hopfield network. And the pay, I had just read this paper by Scott Kirkpatrick on simulated annealing. And, and Jeff and I at the time were trying to struggle with the problem, how do you find a global uh, minimum in a nonlinear network that was riddled with local minima, right? 
because we thought the perception was finding the best solution, right? The global minimum mm -hmm. in energy. Uh, that, that, that Hopfield had, I had, he defined an energy for a, a network. Of, of right, and he had a very linear algebra kind of algorithm for finding that, that optimal, uh, you know, finding for setting up. A ah, no, no, he, he, he was even more clever. Uh, this is a time when the, the local minima, he made, he turned the lemon into lemonade and the local minima were local uh, me memories that uh, you do pat pattern completion right. on. So, so it, you know, but, but it was just a hop, skip and jump to think about the global minimum. And, and so, so that's what we did. We, we heated up the Hopfield network and uh, we started lowering the temperature. And sure enough, if you lowered it slow enough, you got to the global minimum. But something amazing happened along the way, which is that if you don't lower it to zero, but now keep it at a constant uh, in equilibrium and let it come to equilibrium, then it turns out that there's an amazing linearization takes place such that you can compute the, the weights changes in the whole network, no matter how many layers, uh, by just looking at the correlations between inputs and outputs at every synapse. But you, you had a price to pay. You had to be able to do that under two conditions. One, where the inputs and outputs were clamped, that was during the day. And then when you let them free, that was, of course, at night when you're sleeping. So we, we call, you know, this is the two phases and you subtract the two correlations and that gives you the weight update. That's the Bolson machine learning algorithm. So, th so that, that we were convinced that we had figured out how the brain works. Believe me, we were just so overjoyed. And Jeff still thinks so, by the way, he's, despite the fact that, you know, Dave Rommelhart shortly after, it's like the dam broke. You know, once somebody says that, no, they're wrong. There is a way to solve the problem then everybody and his brother now figured out another way to solve it. And uh, Dave's Rommelhart's backprop algorithm is the most efficient. It's just, you know, it's much faster and we're able to, to optimize networks now we know with hundreds of layers. It's, it's, but, it's, but I mean, in this, in this Boltzmann machine thing, the, the, the idea of a day night cycle thing, that was an important, that's an important feature of that, of that approach? Absolutely essential, yeah. And, mm. and, and the reason, here's the reason, the intuition is that, uh, if you're, a, if you're a neuron in the middle of this, of this large network, some, somewhere in the middle layer, you have no idea wh what inputs and outputs are because you're just getting inputs from all over, right? And so how do you know what's relevant from the input and the output, you know, the, the task and what's, and what's not relevant from all the other the data, the things happening? What you do is you go into this sleep state where you have a baseline. These are the correlations when there's no task. And then when there's a task, the correlations change. And now you subtract, because it's linear, you subtract the baseline from the task correlations. And that's what the signal you need to be able to learn the task. But okay, so, so you got Boltzmann machines. And I know, you know, by this point, you and I had, had probably, we'd, we'd met and I remember you were doing the whole net talk um, uh, thing. Net was talk, that? yes. Right. Which you were kind enough to publish in the uh, probably the first issue of my complex systems. I, I did indeed, and that's gotten like you know three thousand citations. It's amazing. So, Good. so thanks we, for contributing to our impact. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> we um, you know I have to say it was turned down by science. So <laughs> oh, okay, all right, we were the second <laughs> second um, uh, thing. But, but, we, but so yeah, that but was we, that that was an example of a of a place where you were learning in that case uh, a human like task. Right. Um, so, so that is interesting. Uh, the story behind it is that uh, it was a summer student who was uh, coming from Princeton, a graduate student of George Miller at Princeton, who came and wanted to do a summer project uh, on linguistics. Again, very, very wonderful kid, very, very good programmer, and very, very, you know, just like Jeff and me, we, he were con he's convinced this is going to be <laughs> the answer to everything, right? And so... <laughs> We, we, you know, we, we, you know, I told him, look, language is really complicated. Let's find a simpler problem, right? And he said, no, 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 it's got to be language. And I said, okay, okay. Well, they're just to, I mean, George Miller is the person famous for, for things like, um, uh, you know, the, the five chunk type thing. And also for the, for the um, uh, word net uh, system. Is that yes. right? Yeah. So he, 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 for two things, seven plus or minus two, that's how many things you can keep in mind at the same time. And then also the ambiguity of words that you know, the same word means five different things. And so how do you know what the meaning is, right? You have to disambiguate it with the right. context. Okay, 
So, so you know, at, at the time, and it's still true, by the way, linguistics was dominated by syntax. It was syntax all the time, word order all the time. This is, of course, Chomsky's uh, great contribution, which has been holding back linguistics for whole generations. Um, well, I think that the, I mean, as, as we know, the modern machine translation systems don't know anything about that stuff. No, they do. They, they, they know word order, but they don't, it's not the only thing they know about. They know the context. They know that it's actually semantics was the, the key breakthrough. You have to understand something about the meaning of the word, not, not just the order, but it, 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 that's another story. <laughs> but our story was that we said we settled on phonology and that's the, the, the sounds that different letters take on, you know, text to speech. And so I went to the library and, and there's a book 300 page book filled with rules. So, you know, AI was dominated by rules at the time, you know, logic and rules. And what the idea was that there were these regularities, like, you know, how do you make a, a, a word past tense? You add an ED, but there's all kinds of exceptions, right? So there's all these exceptions. And so, and, and if you look at the exceptions, depending on where the word came from, you know, French or German, well, it, that the, there are rules for the exceptions. <laughs> no, so you, it's rules all the way down, but it's, it's you know, you, you have a, a, literally 300 pages of this stuff. And, and the engineered systems were, at the time, very, very crude. There's something called deck talk, by the way, which we actually bought because we wanted to get it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think, I think I had one of those and you saw my one of those. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so... <laughs> So we said, okay, let's do something. Let's take a window of seven letters and we'll just move the word through it one letter at a time. And then we'll train the network with one hidden layer to pronounce, the, you know, to attack, to, uh, to predict the phoneme for that letter. Like A has like eight different sounds depending on its neighbors, the letters around it. And lo and behold, it, this, the network just it was amazingly good at being able not just to be trained up on a training set, but then you give it some new words and it, it really did a great job. It would do it about, you know, in fact, you can give it pseudo words that don't exist, you know, twas brillig and the slidey toves that gyre and gimbal in the wave. And it would pronounce it pretty, pretty much what I would, you know, it was, so it had figured out regularities. It could do regularities and on the same network do the, the exceptions. And so that immediately told me that this was a more natural way of representing language. But unfortunately, you know, at the time, these, these networks were tiny. They were like 20,000 parameters and, you know, a few hundred units. And that's all you could do with, uh, it, it was a uh, VAX era. You remember VAX uh, 780? So, Indeed. you know, I, I had gotten the presidential investigator award, so I was able to buy a couple of them, you know, of, of the knockoffs at the time. And, and that, without that, I couldn't have gotten off the ground because, you know, it was very computation intensive. So in any case, that stood out and, and we coupled it to the deck talk so we can actually hear it, right? Because the deck talk could pronounce phonemes. It just, we just gave it a string of phonemes and it, it sounded okay. Right, the deck talk's intrinsic methodology was to use some of these rule-based systems to try and figure out, you know, you right. feed it text, it will say things. Right. And, um, but, but so, okay, so, so after that, that sort of a, a piece of evidence that you can do sort of human-like things using these, model neural nets. But on the other side of your life, so to speak, you were doing actual neurobiology with recording from nerve cells and things like this. Yes, yeah. So I, I maintain a, a wet lab uh, recording. And I, one of the things we did was to uh, record from hippocampal neurons where long-term potentiation was uh, discovered. And we looked for long-term depression. We figured what goes up must come down. And we did find some conditions, but they would turn out not to be as robust as other conditions that were found later. But you know, what we had was really nice because we had a kind of a theoretical, you know, we could ask theoretical questions and then design experiments to answer them, <clears throat> which was actually at the time, uh, you know, wasn't being done in one lab. There was no lab that was able to do that. So, so, and, 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 um, Another, another experiment we did, which I, I was even more important for, for, for my thinking. <clears throat> so, and this, this goes back to the, the very beginning when I was asking about this question about is, is the brain stochastic or deterministic? So <clears throat> the question was how precise are spikes, the timing of the spike, right? And, and it's debated endlessly. 
Mm -hmm. And at the time, the people who were recording from the cortical neurons realized that, well, if you were the, the, the if you get the same input, you get the, the timing of the spikes is different every time. And you have to average over like 10 or 100 times to get an average firing rate that was reproducible. So that, that was every, everybody thought that the spike timing wasn't important. It was, was just the number of spikes, right? And so we did an experiment, Zach Manin, who was now here at the Salk Institute, uh, we set up a lab here and he recorded from a, a, a rat cortex. And what he did was to inject current into the pyramidal cell and see how precise the output was, the spikes coming out. And if you give it a, the, the traditional biophysical input is a step function and then a constant current. If you do that, then the spikes have, because of jitter, don't have any preferred spike timing after the first spike. But if you, uh, but you know, if you record from a, in, in vivo, in, from a, real neuron in, in an animal that is you know, actually alive and the, the, it's fluctuating rapidly because all the inputs are coming in <clears throat> and, and depending on the, the, what the sensory input is, you know, it will radically you know, go up and down, putting bursts of spikes. And so what we did was we, we created a fluctuating input that had a certain amplitude and frequency spectrum. We injected it into the neuron and lo and behold, the spikes came out with millisecond precision. Every, you know, at, at random places that looked like they were random. And now we can analyze what was the signal, what was the feature that caused a that neuron to spike. And it turns out, interestingly, you might think, oh, it's just got a lot of excitatory input. No, because <clears throat> it's when the input actually was uh, low, when, when it was uh, causing the neuron, which is what happens with inhibition, to, to go down from the threshold and then suddenly pop up. So it was an interesting, it's a biphasic uh, signature that was pr pr give, uh, making it possible for these neurons to be able to be very reproducible and spike very precisely for hours and hours and hours. You know, and so, so that, this paper now, again, has been cited thousands of times and it, 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 is, it, it just changed my mind. I said, no, 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 no. The, the, you know, just because you know, you're you're not you're not uh, able to interpret spike timing. Doesn't mean that it's not used for something and important. And by the way, fast forward. One of the one of the exciting things that's happened now with re these recordings from thousands of neurons is that people discovered that this random background activity and the variability in trial to trial is actually a signal. It's not noise. And, and so, what is it? What what's what's going on? What is it? So it turns out that if you uh, do a video of a, of a mouse while it's just sitting there, you know, whiskers are going back and forth and it's, uh, it's snout, it's sniffing and the eyes are going back and forth. It turns out that the background activity in, in the visual cortex and many other parts of the brain <clears throat> contain information about the movement of the face. And in fact, you can account for over half the variance you know, of the fluctuations in, in, in those neurons uh, from the video and vice versa. If, if you, you can record from the background firing rate, you can predict what the face is doing. So it turns out that, that there's, you know, the, suddenly what the, was thought to be noise is a signal, right? And now, now the question is, why is it there? And that's, <clears throat> that's, an, that's why things are, have come to the point now where we can record from enough neurons at the same time to be able to actually make progress. Well, I think one would, you know, one's, one's general impression would be things that have a certain amount of sort of random stuff going on tend to be less fragile than things where you have just one specific path that you're walking down. Yes, yeah, in, in fact, in fact, in fact, part of the reason why these traveling waves are really important is the following simple, you know, thought experiment. If it were the case that as everybody thought, the oscillations were synchronous firing of many neurons at the same time, they, would, they could not convey more information than one big neuron, right? So basically you're reducing information by synchrony. Mm -hmm. But with a traveling wave, you have local synchrony, but because it's traveling in space, 
you have you're spreading the information out over space, not just time. And that that gives you a whole realm. You know, think about holography, right? I mean, there's a whole realm here of, of new coding schemes that you can have with uh, traveling waves, which you couldn't if you just had synchrony. And so, so coming back again to the sort of historical narrative, I mean, you're you were working at Jeff Hinton, you know, Boltzmann machines, things like this. Now, Jeff continued working on kind of uh, uh, you know with back propagation and things like that. Continued working on kind of deep networks for a really long time. And, you know, one didn't really hear much about that. I mean, I, you know, it, for me, as a sort of outside observer of these things, it's just like neural nets are really complicated. A few people work on them, but nothing much is happening here. Was that, right. was that, was that also the impression from the inside or was it completely different from the well, inside? Well, just to show you how, how the, the pendulum had swung. So, you know, the, <clears throat> So I'm the president of the Neural Information Processing Systems Foundation that runs the annual NeurIPS meeting, which was formerly called NIPS. Oh, you changed its name. We, we had to change the name. There was- What's a, it called now? NeurIPS. Okay. No, right. it, 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 it's a long story. I, I remember the story. <laughs> okay. I remember. Let's not do that okay. story. No, 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 let's <laughs> not go there. Okay. Okay. So, but, but the, it was, it was during, it was started, you know, literally in the, in the heyday of the neural network movement. Uh, it was a ragtag group from many, many different disciplines, all of which had the same problem, which was dealing with very complex, uh, large data sets, very complex, like speech, uh, problems in terms of, you know, uh, high dimensional problems, okay. And, and it looked like what we were doing was going to help that, that we were, we're this, that's what the brain is in the business of doing, right, representing information by a very high dimensional space of neurons. And, um, and so as things went along, uh, the, the field morphed uh, into machine learning because it turns out there are other algorithms that you know, could be used for that same, solve the same problem. Uh, you know, there, there was uh, support vector machines that, that was very uh, uh, powerful. Uh, through, you know, the, the uh, kernel trick allowed you to actually go beyond again, one layer of weights and, and produce uh, more sophisticated uh, models. And then uh, Bayesian networks and graph model, graphical models. And, and these kind of rolled in every five years or so. And then, you know. But that was still, I mean, the field of machine learning, the thing that was called machine learning, to my mind, was one of these black art, black magic type fields where people would say, you know, much like various areas of numerical analysis and things like that, people would say, I've got this magic algorithm, it will do this and that thing. And it didn't seem like it was, it was turning into something scientific. It turned out, it looked like it was well, kind of deep in engineering. Tweaking. Yeah, no, y yes and no. I think that what was accumulating over that time was, it was exploration, exploring this whole new dimension you know, and with, with different tools and techniques that people were, uh, you know, you know, just, you know, you're right. It was a lot of it's ad hoc and, and, uh, and there were benchmarks, like for example, ImageNet, you know, people in computer vision had accumulated, you know, tens of millions of images, you know, tens of thousands of categories. And they were making like, you know, half percent improvement in performance every year by handcrafting features for different objects. Right, so that that's that you're right. That was it was all going on in a very ad hoc way, but there was progress going on, and and people were beginning to understand the true nature of the problem that they were up against. But uh, know, and, I, and by I, the way, by the way, some of these some of these algorithms were very effective for particular types of data. So it's not like they weren't they were useless. It's just that they weren't universal. Right. No, I remember. You know, must have been what um, mid two thousands. You know, talking to you, and I was, you know, trying to think about how would we do image processing stuff in in Wolfram language and so on. And I was, you know, I knew the Viola Jones algorithm for face recognition and things like that, which was this weird kind of hacky, you know, thing that says, you know, you do this these pieces of image processing to get. Um, and I, I remember, you know, I was, I was. Um, uh, trying to understand from you, is there a more general way to do this? Because I imagine we'd end up doing sort of data curation where we had somebody making an algorithm for how do you, you know, some other hacky image processing algorithm for recognizing windows and another one for recognizing trees and things like this. And right. 
and that was that seemed to be what you would have to do in the mid 2000s that seemed to be that, that, that that's what that's the way computer vision and by the way paul viola was a graduate student who worked in my lab in that era oh okay and and he actually had a difficult time getting his stuff published you know they didn't like it at the time but he you know eventually he prevailed but it was in but he was that was in image processing i mean his his yeah, yeah. was viewed as it, being... it was it was image processing at the time and and uh and that, that 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 was again the computer vision was very geometrical and 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 he was taking it off in another direction, which is you know look at some way of figuring out what relevant features are for particular objects. But the the, the, the so the, the 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 what you're alluding to the story you're really leading me toward is the following, which is that during that era, uh, neural networks became. Uh, kind of were considered old fashioned and you know weren't didn't live up to the promise in fact someone did a statistical analysis of words that were uh, found in papers that were accepted right and and other words which are negatively correlated it turns out neural networks are negatively correlated with getting your paper published right Right. So that was that was the, you know, probably in the you know 2000s, early 2000s. And, and you know, the, the, but now going back to Jeff Hinton. Right. So he never gave up the, uh, the belief that this was the, the, the way to solve these problems. And and so he at the time was in uh, Toronto and he had gotten uh, money from the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, CIFAR, to put together a program for, for studying networks and, and learning algorithms. Right. And it was focused at the beginning, it was focused on vision, but later it, it broadened. And I was on the advisory board. So I saw this happen. I, was, I, was, I saw it, what happened was that he collected all the people that still believed in neural networks, that, that not just people in his vicinity in Canada, but also bringing people like me from outside, uh, Apo Hivarinen, for example, from Finland and you know, others. Uh, uh, I can't do the pronunciation of Finnish names. Is that, is that the same person as the support vector machines person, or is that a different person? No, it's a different person. He he he. This guy uh, is comes from Cohonen's group, which is oh, okay. Uh, self organizing maps. Yeah, that was the self organizing maps business. Yeah, that for that 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 uh, tradition, that tradition. Okay, but he but he's if now he's a very very uh, prominent guy. You know, information theory and and nonlinear uh, ICA, for example. Mm -hmm. so ICA is another one of these things that came up in that period, independent component analysis, which is, has been proven to be a very, very practical algorithm for many different purposes, but you know, it was inspired by the brain. Now, so Jeff had had this view. And, and so I, the, the, I remember we were at a meeting and I remember them, uh, Jan Lacoon, and he was part of that group and Joshua Bengio was part of the group. And we were sitting around at dinner and Jan said, you know, one of my graduate students has gotten this GPU, graphics processing unit, and has been programming it. And he claims he can speed things up by a factor of 100. <gasps> no, really? A factor of 100? Okay. As you know, you know, when you make incremental advances, you know, even, even uh, with Moore's law, you don't get a factor of 100 overnight, right? And so literally within a year, all these labs had GPUs in them. And suddenly they could massively increase the size of the network. They could do their experiments much more quickly. They, they could take on large data, larger data sets. And in fact, in that was the 2012 NeurIPS meeting that was held in Lake Tahoe, where uh, Jeff's group, uh, two graduate students uh, working with uh, which would now was called a deep learning, you know, CNN, convolutional neural network, uh, reduce the error in, in the image net, predicting what an object is from its image on, on the test set by a factor of 20%, 20%. That's like a factor of 20 bigger than the average uh, improvement per year in computers, like going 20 years into the future, order of magnitude. Right. But I mean, the previously everybody who'd won those those uh, uh, recognition competitions, th those had been kind of traditional image processing kind of tweaked 
models. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, very, very labor intensive. And, and you know, the, the graduate student can spend, you know, years working on one class of objects just to be able to, you have to do, find features that are variant to orientation and that are specific to the object and, and di differentiated from other objects. And so, you know, it's, it's, it, this just takes time and effort, you know, it's, it's labor intensive. And so the beauty of, of, <laughs> of these uh, deep learning networks is that the very same learning algorithm could be used on any uh, problem where you have enough data and, and you have enough computing. So, you know, it, it, it really, and, and okay, I should also say that during that time, there are innumerable advances, the incremental advances in efficiencies and understanding of, of how to organize it. For example, in the convolutional neural network, Jan LeCun realized that, you know, in addition to having convolutions, uh, you can also improve performance if you uh, pool, if you take uh, features from neighboring locations. And, and of course, that's what a complex cell does in the visual cortex. And then you have normalization so that you keep things within did Jan know that analogy to neurobiology? Or he, he's not, he was a physicist, right? No, no, uh, uh, Jan is an engineer. And, and the answer is he, 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 it was a period during which he tried hundreds and hundreds of tricks. Some of them worked, most of them didn't. And, and that was in the group of tricks. And they just happened to be the ones that were found in the brain, right? I mean, you know, it wasn't like he was trying to reproduce the brain. Right. Or, you know, that, but but it, but it, the, the convergence is what's important is the fact that you know he he showed that we, those those are good uh, architectural features and and otherwise you know people who were studying you know, Hubel Weasel had no concept of what complex cells were good for right <laughs> and it was like it's another cell type right and you know and and this now gives us some intuition about that but so back in the days of Hopfield and so on everybody would say. Well, yes, it's kind of inspired by neural nets in the brain, but the ways that these systems are working is nothing like the way brains work. And I think that was still being said at the time when people were, were doing you know, back propagation, all these kinds of things. It's like, well, that's a good engineering trick, but it's not how the brain works. Yeah, yeah, uh, the, 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 that, that goes way back to the eighties. And, uh, and I, I think that what we were doing back to, I, I, Patrick and I wrote this book, Computational Brain, and, we pointed out that these these were demonstrations, and these that's, these were, that's the last one I have on my table here. I have ah, that one. Ah, finally came <laughs> back to it. Yes, okay. Well, that that was a bestseller. It was like twenty five thousand books, you know, for MIT Press, which is a lot for a technical book, but maybe not as many as you sold. <laughs> no, yeah, right. <laughs> Some. Uh, but the uh, but, but the message was that we could begin for the first time to create. Uh, networks, populations of neurons in a, that in a distributed way could solve complex uh, problems with, through transformation through layers of hidden units, right? And 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 it, it was it was it was at that time you know very small and tiny, but it, it it gave us it gave us a way to construct the network, and now we can analyze the network and try to figure out principles. And now what's happened? You know, like you say, there was this long fallow period, but then suddenly. Bang! You know, it hits uh, the we, we, the, the a, a threshold where suddenly you can begin to solve larger, more complex problems, in in many areas at the same time. And that was the interesting thing. Why is it that it happened at the same time in vision, and speech, and language translation? Right? There's probably some minimum amount of computation that needs to be done. But uh, the you know the the we we and this is something that we didn't understand it was all about scaling you need to have a large enough system and of all the algorithms in ai in machine learning this one was amazingly scaled extremely well why, why and how how is that why is that well it's because if you have an algorithm where you can distribute the load over many many small processors right then it just naturally falls onto massively parallel machines right so this this is you know, the marriage made in heaven in terms of uh, taking advantage of the, the, the hardware. Now it's all multiprocessor clusters, right? That's how. Well, it, it's not so easy to do training like that. I mean, that there are many practical problems in that. And oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, this is uh, Google has, has, has been working on this. And actually, uh, the, the latest twist is that uh, what you do is you uh, keep, keep the data in 
the nodes and you pass the network around. <laughs> Any case. Uh, Right. Well, that's you know, kind they're, of the... they're, 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 it's all incremental and it's all about hardware. And, and that here we are scaling. It's all about scaling. And, and, and here's I, I wrote a, a, a paper in PNAS with the title. This was at a, it came from a meeting that the National Academy had organized by some mathematicians. And the title of the paper is The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Deep Learning in Artificial Intelligence. And Stephen will recognize the reference to the Eugene Bigner chapter, which is the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and physics. And, and, and my uh, kind of take on it is that all of the theorems and the insights and the intuition that mathematicians and statisticians have had have come from low dimensional problems where the goal is to find a unique solution with a small number of parameters, right? And, and they, they, they're good at that. They're very, they're, they're, they're theorems and they have algorithms and so forth. They're very good at that. But once you go to a, a very high dimensional space, the geometry is completely different. And now it, it, they're, they're, you know, all those theorems that no longer apply and you have to really start coming up with a new way to analyze uh, the, 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 the way that these networks are able to learn and solve these difficult problems, right? It's, it, it, we're just at the beginning of this. We don't actually understand yet uh, those principles, but, we're, uh, but, but now there's nothing holding us back because look, we have access to every single unit, every single weight, every single input. If we can't figure that out, how are we gonna figure out how the brain works? Right, well, I mean, but I think that, you know, a couple of points. I mean, first of all, you know, the question of where does deep learning work? You know, deep learning works on certain kinds of problems that are similar problems to the ones that we humans seem to do decently well on. And it's probably the case that we organize our lives and our environments so that we are confronted with problems which are ones which our brains manage to deal with. Right. That is, it might not be the, and so in other words, it's a bit of a circular thing that insofar as, you know, we could imagine problems which neural nets will not do very well on, those problems will also be not things that our brains would do well on. They're probably not things that we choose to live around, so to speak. Um, right, right. Uh, it, you know, the, <clears throat> so he, here's another chapter from my uh, deep learning book, which is that uh, the history of computing can really, uh, the, the, the theoretical side can be traced to the, the actual machine, the von Neumann architecture, right? So we had, we had this in the 50s. We had to, to build these things. And so the, the whole, all the algorithms are optimized for this architecture, right? And, and it's just been produced wonderful results that have you know, per, per, permeated all of the uh, you know, technologies. But now, okay, if you think about computation space, and as you know, you know from cellular automata, right, it's a much broader space. And we're just having now the, the first explorations of that space. And, and we're coming back with, you know, uh, uh, like Lewis and Clark. And that, that's incredible, you know, that there is Buffalo out there, <laughs> you know? Right. And well, I think uh, one of the key things is most of that space is not stuff that we humans care about or typically deal with. And, 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 mo and, and well, it, that may be true, but that doesn't mean that's not, not useful or important. No, no, I, I agree. Still, right, you know, right, I, right, I right. Suspect... Okay, we agree. Okay, that's good. Uh, and, and I think that the way I, I put it is that there's a universe of computation and you know, we have a few algorithms that seem to work, but you know, there's, a, there's literally a, gonna be galaxies of algorithms of, of different computational characteristics right. and architectures. And, and you know, we're just, just starting we can, and, and actually, you know, one of the biggest uh, uh, boosts right now in this field is, by the way, it went from being called neural networks to machine learning, and now it's called artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> again? Really? It's called AI again? I thought AI yes. was dying again. The well, we resuscitated it. It's now, believe me, it's the hottest thing, I mean, in the business world, right? AI is like one of these memes now that people I think use. that's two years ago, Terry. I think that, it, I think it, um, it, it was. Um, oh, okay. I, I'm out of. I think I'm it's a little touch. bit on the down 
swim. I'm out of touch. Of course, these things come and go, but the reality right. is that these they're still using these networks, right? I mean, they're still For sure. Yes. There's still uh, applications that they have a, a, a impact. No, I, I think what's what's happened is you know neural net technology, like linear algebra back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. You know, it's become a thing that is a component in lots of kinds of methods for doing things. That's right. That's exactly the way I look at it. It's mm -hmm. it's it's like it's like it's as if you had a machine a language instruction that said recognize the object in that image. You press the you press the 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 the, the, the uh, that that uh, instruction and you get back the answer, right? right. That, that's really what we've come down to, right? But you still have to put it together into a system that actually right. is. But so okay. let's come back. Let's come back to neuroscience again. So let's say you say, okay, we now understand something about a a at least an, an analog machine code for how sort of uh, various kinds of AI like processes can work. We know that these you know neural nets can do things that are like these kinds of things that we see brains do. So now the question is, so we, we know something about the machine code. Now the question is, what would be what would be laws of neuroscience that you might like to discover? That is, if you were going to do, let's say, for example, in our, in our model of physics these days, we understand something about how kind of things work at the level of atoms of space. But those atoms of space are far, far below things like general relativity and quantum mechanics. Right. But what emerge from those dynamics are things like general relativity and quantum mechanics, which are global laws of physics. Right. I'm curious, for neuroscience, if you could imagine, you know, you're starting from sort of the atoms of neuroscience, of individual neurons and doing their neural netty kinds of right. things. Right. What would it look like? What would the intermediate layer of kind of the general okay. relativity of neuroscience be like? So, I mean, this is a hot area right now. Um, that is to say, both in neuroscience and in uh, machine learning. Uh, so, you know, if, if you know, so here's a, a typical experiment: you record from a neuron, and then you give it a, a, a sensory stimulus, and you see how it responds. Okay, well, that's a correlation. That's not the same as causation, right? In other words. Can you conclude that because this neuron fired to an edge, that that was causing the percept of an edge, mm -hmm. you know, your perception of the edge? Well, that, that's just a correlation. You, you haven't proven causality. So the real, uh, and, and, and this has now become true for understanding, you know, if you want to understand intelligence, you have to understand how it is that you extract causality from data, not just correlation. And, and here's where we, we, we are, uh, I think there's gonna be a real, uh, you know, trans, you know, it, 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 incredible opportunity this is a, right now. Okay, so this is, that, that uh, is, is just coming online. Uh, and, and this has to do with, coming up with a, a new framework for causality. So the traditional framework, which goes back to Judea Pearl, early days of AI, uh, was that you, uh, causality can be worked out if you have an acyclic directed graph, right? Where it, it, X affects Y, affects Z, and, and but not the Z does, cannot come back and affect X, right? Because that that would make it a DAG, a directed DAG, acyclic graph. directed acyclic graph, DAG, exactly. And there you can make progress. And 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 there the way that you make progress is by perturbing the the, the system somehow, you know, activating right. a node or something. No, but um, back to physics, it's like uh, don't have any closed time like curves. That's kind of the criterion for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's so that's uh, part of the the lore. Now, the so now neuroscientists have created tools and techniques for doing exactly that. So, what we can do now is with viruses and channel redops, and we can uh, uh, stimulate with light a particular type of neuron in a particular part of the brain, and we can see how that perturbation affects behavior. So that gives us. Of the, the, that takes us to the next level because now we can at least you know in the, we're in the DAG universe of, of, of causality, but I don't think that that's going to be 
the whole story. And here's the reason. Uh, <laughs> if you actually look at the graph of connectivity in the brain, it's not a dag. <laughs> it's, it's a tremendous amount of feedback. Right. At every level. You know, and, and, and what, it, what it means is that somehow the, the brain is working at a different level or scale in terms of how it is able to put together uh, not, not just sensory inputs, but also experiences you've had and memories that can then lead to hypotheses, basically, that then can be tested. And that's right, what I mean, your statement about DAGs, the fact that the pattern of connections between neurons has cycles in it. If you think about the, the space-time history of the brain, it's perfectly possible and in fact, will be the case that the causal graph that represents, you know, this neuron fires causing this other neuron to fire, that thing will be some kind of, you know, partially ordered set of that says, you know, this thing happened, then that thing happened and so on. I mean, I, you know, what's interesting about that structure is it happens to be the same formal structure that shows up in our physics project. Um, the only difference with our physics project, although that may even be in our, uh, you know, the, the underlying structure of space is a hypergraph where you have essentially these sort of atoms of space that are connected. And that's, I think, in, um, uh, you know, uh, presumably for brains, we can think of the connection of neurons as being like a graph. Is that a, is that a true statement or is it, is it more like a hypergraph? I mean, what, what is the, how, how should we, what, what if, if we, is the connectome a graph or a hypergraph or something quite different? You know, <clears throat> I, I think it's too, too early to say, and here's why, uh, you know, the, the wiring diagram is really, doesn't have the answers because it's really the dynamics in the graph. Like for example, if, if all you had was just literally just a graph in the computer, right? How do you, how do you know how the information flows through it? And, uh, and there's a lot of, Dynamics, for example, there's a lot of gates that regulate the flow of information between areas, right? Uh, <clears throat> attention. So what is attention? Attention is a way of amplifying some parts of the activity from some parts of the graph to more strongly influence the downstream, right? That's attention. And interestingly, the, the most recent advances in deep learning like GPT-3 have been all attention all the time. In other words, you just amp up the attention. And, and now you're creating subgraphs, maybe partially ordered in some way, that can have much more flexible and much more power in terms of organizing on a conceptual level, you know, the semantic organization of language. So, you know, I, 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 I think that the answer to your question is that yes and no. Uh, it's, it's an important first step, but it's not enough on its own. You, you need to have understanding of the dynamical properties of the synapses and the, the way that uh, neurons are gated. Right, so I mean, one thing that's kind of interesting in, in our kind of model of physics, what we're dealing with is, you know, the structure of space is some kind of hypergraph. There is this, uh, you know, local rule that determines kind of uh, effect of one piece of this hypergraph on another, but the space-time history is some kind of causal graph. And, you know, what you're describing as attention is curiously similar to what one thinks about in uh, uh, perhaps in kind of the structure of you know causal structure and general relativity and so on. So in other words, the the um, the question is you know when you're breaking up into certain different regions, that's kind of like an event horizon in a causal graph. That is, you're having a region of space time of a space which doesn't communicate with some other region. And I, I uh, what what you're what you're making me wonder is whether there's actually more more direct analogies, but, but I'm sort of curious, you know, imagine that, you know, we've got this description at the level of individual neural nets and we can compute things with neural nets and we can make them run and do engineering and so on. The question is, if there was a more global theory, if there was something that would tell you sort of, you know, you'd say, what's going on in the brain? What's the, what's the kind of bigger story of neuroscience that is beyond just we have this specific neuron and this specific kind of cell that you know interacts in this particular way. What, uh, just like we could say the same thing about space-time, 
we could say, if we didn't have our current perception of space, we could just say there are all these atoms of space, they're all getting updated, they all have these connections to neighboring atoms, um, you know, it's all very, very complicated. We don't have a global picture that might be something like general relativity. So the question would be, what would be the analogous kind of kind of thing that you could imagine in neuroscience? What would be the, you know, what is the sort of higher level theory? Or put another way, if we even went up from actually a diff different kind of way of thinking about it, you know, we've got things at the level of individual neural net layers and so on and so on and so on, like in our, you know, Wolfram language stuff, we have all of these layers programmed up and, and you, can, you can kind of construct programs by putting together layers and so on. The question is, if we wanted a higher level of programming, what would it look like? It's sort of, there's, there's both that and the kind of, if we right. had a global theory that was something like general relativity, what would it look like? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to say this, but I think that you know it's too early for grand unified theories of the brain. <laughs> I think that, in other words, uh, there are a lot of people out there who have them, you know, and uh, I think the chance of any one of them being well, what's the kind of thing that one of those grand unified theories tells you? What's the kind of, I mean, because like, in, if we're talking about space time, the fact that we're interested in gravity and the curvature of space, it's not self-evident. If you were down at the level of looking at individual atoms of space right. and their connections, right. it's not at all self-evident that that's the kind of question you would, we would think yeah. to ask yeah. about. So, okay, so here's um, what I'm working on right now. Uh, so uh, I, I, earlier I talked about these peptides. And uh, so they're called neuromodulators. Uh -huh. uh, and what's the difference between a neurotransmitter and neuromodulator is that the neurotransmitter works directly on an ion channel and opens and closes it. Whereas a neuromodulator doesn't do that directly. It influences internal uh, biochemical pathways and influences all sorts of other machinery inside the cell to change the way the cell actually behaves, the way it responds to other inputs. So it modulates the cell. So I, I think- is, is that also what like psychoactive drugs do? Yes, all, all psych, by the way, not just psychoactive drugs, but all drugs that have, are used for mental disturbances. You're like, you know, psychotic uh, drugs, Thorazine and for uh, manic depressive disorders and so forth. I mean, they're all working on the neuromodulatory systems. And, and, by, and all the, uh, you know, uh, hallucinogens too, right? LSD. Those, those are, those are all affecting the neuromodulators. Not a, not, not a coincidence. It's because it, that, that directly affects perception, right? And these neuromodulators are really, they can reconfigure a network. And, and I'll give you the classic example is the lobster uh, ganglion. It's called a stomatogastric ganglion. That this is another one of these crazy animal location things. Okay, lobster. It's a lobster. It's a lobster or crayfish. Okay. And it has a stomach that's innervated by this little ganglion. It only has like 30 neurons, so it's, it's tiny. But it's very sophisticated because the muscles are not orthogonal or anything like, you know, skeletal muscles. They're, they're all interweaved and it's a, you know, high dimensional problem. In any, any case, there are two rhythms that this ganglion puts out with the same set of 30 neurons. There's one rhythm, uh, which is the pyloric cycle. I think it, it has a time scale of about one per second. And then there's a gastric mill, which is like a tenth of a second. So it's like a 10 second period. Now, what's amazing is that neuromodulators can switch it back and forth between those two, the very same set of neurons with very different phase relationship between the outputs so that the same muscles are now doing something different with the food that is coming in. One, it grinds it up and then it has to push it out. So, you know, so, the, so this is, and so now I think that, that what we're, we're talking about here, which is causality, I think is being controlled by these neuromodulators. And, uh, and, and you know, and so the very same network, if all you have is a graph, you wouldn't know this, can be reconfigured, reshaped to do many different things. And, well, and I mean, it's not the network, it's the, it's the pattern of activity in the network. It, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, 
it's kind of like a heart or something where yeah. if you poke it in the wrong way, it will go into fibrillation. Right, right. It, that, so that's it. So that's the, the organizing the pattern of activity with, uh, with something that looks like a fixed network, but makes it, but it's much more flexible and, and you ha it has to be robust. And this is the key that most people have left out, which is you, wanna, you want a, something that is guaranteed to be invariant to temperature over some range. And you know, all chemical reactions variable with temperature, vary the, the reaction rates. Uh, and then you want the system to be able to rapidly reconfigure. I mean, not just. Right. You know, but in effect, what you're talking about there is, a, is an attractor like thing, but not with respect to a single static state of the system. But you're talking about something which is, uh, you know, an attractor that has some essentially space time character to it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but but I mean, my my question would be, if if you're going kind of so so you're saying these neuromodulators are a way of describing kind of the the space of larger scale attractors that they're they're, they're, a, they're a way of sculpting the space of larger scale attractors going beyond the level of the individual what an individual neuron where you know mediated right. by neurotransmitters is doing, right? right. So it's, it's kind of a slower time scale, you know, larger scale thing. So so you're describing so you're thinking of that as kind of a, a different level of modularity in the system where you've got the individual neurons are doing their thing, but right. this is controlling a larger scale. And, and, and that's the scale at which emotions take place. Yeah, but, but so, but I mean, so if you were to represent that, presumably, just like we have kind of McCulloch pits and beyond neural nets to represent the individual neurons with their neurotransmitters, presumably there is a similar model of what happens at the level of neuromodulators. Is that, is that true? And is it, is it the same kind of model or is it a different kind of model? Well, we're, we're exploring that right now. We've been doing some simulations. We've used recurrent neural network uh, learning algorithms to actually try to push it and see how, how, how to create uh, reconfigurable networks. So that we have, we have a, a paper that right now is uh, under revision. So yeah, the, 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 this is a hot area right now. Like I said, this is, this is, a, this is a frontier and. Uh, and again, we're, we're, inspiration is coming from biology, uh, and right. and and in fact, the, the the tagline on my book, you picked it up. Could you read the tagline? Well, the which top? tagline? This is the. It's red, I think it's in red at the top. Which this one here? The the. At the very top, yeah. Artificial intelligence meets human intelligence. I'm trying to remember Terry because I I was. You know, I was involved in pushing you to to name this book something reasonable. I think I think what was the previous name of this book? It went through so many different names, but you're, Stephen, you are absolutely right. You can take credit. Oh, I think that our discussion was. I think this was, had, this was my you, you, name. You, 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 you suggested this. You, you, yeah, right. You, you, but, you deserve credit. Okay, now it's but, all coming back to me. You gave you gave me the title for the book, right? Right, but, it, but it I was smart a, enough to recognize that it was a good title. Yes, right. <laughs> okay, so so um. Uh, so artificial intelligence meets human intelligence. Okay, so this is your your concept for kind of the the um, uh, the theory of um, of what deep learning is about. I it's 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 not just deep learning. It turns out that reinforcement learning and is another good example, right? It, it actually is a part of optimization theory, right? Uh, engineers have used it for quite a while. It came that you know it's a temporal difference learning came from Rich Sutton, who was an engineer, and. And, and now we, we think that uh, this is the leading theory for a part of the brain called the basal ganglia and the dopamine neurons. We know, and this has been shown over and over again, uh, are representing something called reward prediction error. That means they respond not just to the reward, but whether it's the a reward that you expected. And, and if it's what you expected, you don't change any strengths of any synapse, but if you get more or less, then you reconfigure the synapses. So, the, so that's a, but it, the, the reinforcement learning system by itself is very slow and kludgy, and without the deep learning part for the representation, it's it's not very powerful. So the idea though is that we have different parts of the brain that have been con different algorithms that work together to solve the difficult problems, and and I think that we're getting inspiration from those different parts of the brain, but there there are still there are still major mysteries that haven't been. Uh, like the ones you're alluding to, like causality, which I think we're just beginning to uh, formulate. 
But I mean, we can imagine various different kinds of descriptions. We can imagine a description at the level of individual neurons and neural networks and sort right. of the deep learning story. We can imagine a description at a sort of a more symbolic level of we've got some kind of human understandable language level description. I mean, this is the okay. story okay. of my life. Of, of Okay, 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 okay. So look, look, okay, this, this is an age old issue, you know, top down or bottom up. And let's look at the history of AI. It was born in the 50s at the same time as the computer. So what do you do? What kind of algorithms do you look for? Well, you look for algorithms that the slow computers can do really well, like logic. That, that's what they do really well. And, and rules, right? So you look in the universe of logic for, for solutions. And But what, what solutions are you looking for? Well, you, you're using your intuition about how is it that, you know, Language is done. Well, your intuition tells you that it's all about symbol manipulation, right? I mean, it's very plausible that, you know, that these symbols are being manipulated by their order and they, 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 they somehow represent things that are, uh, con, you know, conceptual things that are abstract and so forth. And, you know, that, that, that's kind of the, that's kind of a, a it's called folk psychology. You know, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's a, a story we tell ourselves because it's a simple story and it kind of explains it to first order. But the reality is that with that kind of first order model, you can't get anywhere in the real world because the real world is very complex with many different dimensions and factors and interactions, very high order. And, and you need to have a system that can represent that. that and, and I think that that's really the problem is that if, if you use your intuition about anything, there's no reason why nature should allow you to understand how the brain works because that's not gonna help you. All you need to know is what, what the right behavior is. And if you can do that and, and make a story up about why you did it, that's all you need to survive. Right, but I think, I mean, you know, the way I see it in this sort of computational universe of possible programs, most do, as I would say, computationally irreducible things. Most do very complicated stuff. Those uh, and that's a lot of what nature uses to do the things it does, including things inside brains. But we humans carve out for our activities a small corner of what is possible in the computational universe that has the feature that it has a certain amount of computational reducibility. So some things about what happened in our world are predictable. And if you know, we we could we could try and live at the level of computational irreducibility then nothing would be predictable. We would never have invented science. Right. We wouldn't have been able to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and so how do you get to that? So you're asking the question of, okay, well, how are we going to find out how that's done, right? That's your question, I think. Well, right. no, I, I think that, that, that we, it's like an attractor kind of thing. We, you know, given our sensory data, we can, uh, you know, we can recognize certain regularities of the world which we then make use of in engineering. We build technology about, around the regularities that we've recognized. Then perhaps, you know, in biological evolution, we build more sensory apparatus that makes use of the things that we've, you know, we've been able to use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we, you know, we're kind of we're kind of carving ourselves into some corner of this sort of computational universe of possibilities. Right. And and how and how does that how is that done? How does the brain do that? Well, what do you mean? Well, the question is, in you know, we are we are given a brain that has a certain structure. That structure allows us to recognize certain reducibilities in the world. There might be quite other reducibilities that a brain of a completely different structure would recognize. Like, for example, we might, you know, in, at a more mathematical level, we might recognize periodicity. And um, you know, but there might be some completely different structure, you know, nested structures, fractal structure, something like that, which will be recognized by a different kind of thing. But so, you know, we have brains that recognize certain regularities. We build our world around the regularities that our brains recognize. And no doubt in evolutionary biology, you know, those regularities that we have been able to make use of, we then produce brains that are better at dealing with those kinds of regularities and so on. So I think, you know, my, my view would be that the, the thing that, um, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We, we, you know, in other words, we have a brain that can deal with certain kinds of regularities. 
So we set up our world to have those kinds of regularities. So the fact, you know, you talk about the unreasonable effectiveness of neural nets, in a sense, my argument would be the reason they seem unreasonably effective is because the things in our world are things we have constructed things in our world for which those methods work. And it's the same reason, by the way, it's the same reason that Wigner thought mathematics was unreasonably effective in physics, because physics was basically defined to be the area in which mathematics worked. You know, <laughs> when you have turbulence and things like this, you, you know, it's an area where mathematics didn't work so well. Right. Right. And where, and, and that was like, oh, that was not taught in physics. And so right. I, you know, my claim would be, but, but I, I think that still doesn't address the issue of, I mean, you're talking about kind of the symbolic paradigm for things. And, you know, I think that the, you know, since I've spent a large part of my life building a computational language that is a kind of symbolic representation of the world, why is that a good idea? Why isn't it just neural nets all the way down? Well, I think the answer is that it's, you know, what, what elevates one beyond the level of what, uh, you know, what, what allows one to build a taller tower is having something that has kind of a, a uh, uh, you know, where you have this actual structure that you can build on, on top of, so to speak. Whereas in the case of, uh, I mean, in other words, one's, one's taking with this kind of symbolic approach, one is abstracting certain aspects of the world that we are capable of building in a sort of taller tower. And the question would be, when we look at neural nets, we can say, we can look at what you were describing as kind of the folk psychology of things. We can say, you know, we're going to describe the world symbolically using things that we recognize at a sort of psychological cognitive level. But now if I want to go downwards and I want to say, I want to actually describe how brains work, not at the level of individual neurons, but at a level that's sort of intermediate between the sort of the cognitive level of how I make, make up my sig symbolic language and the level of individual neurons. What's in between? What's, okay, the, so what's the description of, right. you know, if you have a deep learning system and you say, oh, I can, you know, I've done this a zillion times in, in our fine language, you can just take some, some standard, you know, image recognition network and you can break it halfway through and you can see what was it thinking halfway through the network. Right. And it looks like garbage. And the question okay, is okay. what- Right, okay, well, here's, some, here's a place where you could help us which is that uh, you've been able to take, uh, make the transition from the uh, substructure, you know, the, all the fine details to a uh, level where causality uh, simplifies or is, is capable of, of reorganizing the larger scale structure. Okay, how did that happen? Maybe there's something similar that could happen with neurons, right? If, if we use the same uh, tools that you're using. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, in, in the case of physics, you know, we have now an understanding of how does general relativity arise from the apparently uncorrelated sort of just, you know, uh, these little pieces of space are being rewritten in a certain way. We know that there's this, in fact, I've just been uh, writing about this myself, this, what I'm describing as the multi-computational paradigm of, of um, uh, kind of this large number of, of sort of independent events that update a system. And the question is, how do you make sense? Okay, so the usual way of thinking about like, let's say a cellular automaton, the thing has some state, some sequence of black and white cells. It has some rule that say how to make the next state. And what you get is essentially this linear sequence in time of you know, this, how the state of the system evolves. That sequence can be computationally irreducible. It can be the case that you can't know what the end result of that sequence is without following every step. But fundamentally, time is still a one-dimensional thing where you're going from one state to the next and so on. In what we're doing in physics, one of the things that happens is we have this notion that there are these updates that can happen, and these updates can happen sort of anywhere they choose to happen. And that means you don't get a single thread of time. You get these things that I've called multi-way systems where you've basically got this kind of branching and merging sequence of threads of time. So you've got this kind of interwoven sequence of threads of time. And one feature of that is if you say, well, what happened in the system at time t equals whatever? The answer is there's no definite thing to say. 
because there are many different threads of time that are being followed. And to say what happened, you basically have to imagine an observer and you have to sort of define a reference frame and you have to say, how is, how is somebody going to take all these different threads and knit them together? And so, in fact, this comes back to what we were talking about with Wheeler and, and uh, kind of observation of the universe and so on. In this multi-way system paradigm, there is no choice but to have an observer involved. And it turns out that, you know, the thing we found is that, uh, again, it's a little bit more elaborate in the physics case, and I haven't quite unraveled how it will work in other cases. When the observer is themselves embedded within the system, uh, if the observer, okay, the key thing about the observer uh, for physics is that the observer sequentializes time. That is, there are many fingers of time that are going on. There are many, you know, there's branching and merging network of, of uh, possible histories, but you say the observer just has the point of view that time is sequentialized. So the observer just imagines that everything is just flowing in, in one sort of uh, stream of time. As soon as you say that, you inevitably get general relativity. So the question would be for brains, uh, is there an analogous kind of thing? You've got all these, all these neurons and they're all getting updated and you could, in an actual brain, the, um, uh, you know, in an actual brain, an actual particular instance of a brain, there is a particular sequence of firings that happen in the brain. But you can imagine, you know, in your models of brains, I suspect you imagine that these neurons could be firing at different times. They just have certain environment that causes them to fire or not fire. There's a certain, uh, and so you can imagine, I mean, again, this is, this is descending into a level of technical detail about, uh, about kind of, um, uh, you know, the construction of multi-way graphs and the construction of causal graphs and so on. But the, the question about the whole thing is, you know, if you want to say collectively, what can you say about brains, right? You've, you've made, you know, you've talked about things like traveling waves and so on, which are collective effects on brains at the level of, at a very kind of coarse non-cognitive level. And the question is, if you are going to talk about things at a more, uh, you know, at a level of sort of deriving psychology from neurons, what would that look like? What would, what would, what could you imagine? Could you imagine a theory like if, if somebody said n years in the future, well, actually, general relativity applied to the brain? What would that look like? What would, what would, what kind of a thing would you say? That is, um, I mean, it's it's similar to, uh, well, for example, I've been thinking about how these various ideas we have in physics, how that formalism applies to different fields. So for example, one I've been thinking about is economics, where the, you know, a key question in economics is, why is it reasonable to say that things have a value? As opposed to just saying there are all these little transactions that are happening between different agents, you say that's well described by saying the value of gold is this. It's not obvious that that would be the case. So my question is in brains, what would be the analogous kind of collective statement that you could imagine making that goes beyond just the level of, oh, there are these individual things happening with individual neurons and so on. And I, you know, what would, what would be the, I mean, and I, I guess I'm curious, I know that, um, uh, I mean, I haven't really followed and I have to ask you about, um, uh, um, uh, you know, there are people we both know like, like Jeff Hawkins and so on, who has various sort of, somewhat higher level theories of how brains work, which I don't know anything about. I've never understood them. Uh, you know, are there any of these kind of emerging sort of higher level theories of how, how neural nets slash brains work that one should be thinking about? So I, what I think you've arrived at is called consciousness. Well, right? I think I think but I in other words, In other words, it, it, it's the high level description we have of something that happens in the world and that we're conscious of, that we can put into words, right? I mean, that, that, that's a, a kind of a crude way of, do, of, of saying it. But, uh, but I think there are, there are theories of consciousness uh, that are out there. Uh, there <clears throat> there's one that has to do with complexity that... Uh, uh, but what will be a thing? See, the thing that bothers me. So for example, I've thought a bit, as you know, recently about consciousness and I am, I am at best an applied consciousness researcher, so to speak, in the following sense, that the question that, that I have is, uh, 
you know, why do we perceive the laws of physics that we perceive? So in the case of statistical mechanics, you know, you've got a bunch of gas molecules bouncing around in a box, but yet our perception of what happens in, in thermodynamics is something about gas laws, you know, pressure and temperature and things like that. It is not self-evident that we would perceive a gas at that level. We might perceive it at the level of individual molecules, but because of the way that we sort of coarse grain things, we perceive it in terms of pressure and temperature. And that means we believe that the laws of thermodynamics work and all kinds of other things. So my use of quotes consciousness is to say, what attributes do we have that cause us to conclude that things like space exist? And you know, I think the answer to that is, what you need is basically two attributes, computational boundedness of the observer and sequentialization in time. So in other words, if, if once you have those two attributes, you, 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 just like in the case of, of statistical mechanics, having the idea that you do coarse graining gives you the second law of thermodynamics, gives you the gas laws, things like this. So similarly, just knowing those very basic things about quotes consciousness, that it's computationally bounded and that sequentializes time, imply that we will perceive the laws of physics that we perceive. Now, maybe there are finer, there's a, you know, to say it, you sequentialize in time and you're computationally bounded, many things beyond brains will do that. I mean, we, we can, it might not be, you know, we could imagine the alien intelligence that doesn't do that, but many things that aren't just brains do that. Now, maybe when we think specifically about brains, there are more attributes that we should be imagining than just sequentialization in time and computational boundedness. And the question would be, what's the, what's the broader category that talks about theories of brains as opposed to merely theories of consciousness as far as you need it to get physics? So, so do you know uh, Dan Hoffman? I do not. He has a book. You should take a look at it. I, I think I have it here somewhere. No, he, he has an interesting um, thought along those lines, <clears throat> which is the following. That... You know, evolution gave us sensors that help us survive, right? Mm -hmm. And it may well be that there's a lot more going on out there, which we don't have sensors for because it doesn't matter for survival. Absolutely. The, the, the individual configuration of molecules in a gas is not something that we make use of. We only make use of overall, you know, in a fluid, for example, we care about the water is flowing in more or less this way. We don't have sensors and don't care about the more detailed microscopic motions. So yes, I agree that that's a, I mean, I, I don't think it's necessarily the case that we live in the only attractor for how you can exist in the world. Well, that, 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 that then is what he explores, which is that what other realities could there be? But I, I like your, the way that you have set up the problem, which, which has to do with uh, constraints that it, it, are needed uh, may, and maybe are inevitable, right? If, if you're going to be able to perpetuate uh, right. life as we know it. Right, but I think, I think the, the key thing in, in my way of thinking about this is there's, you know, the generic cellular automaton or something has computationally irreducible behavior. You can't predict what it's going to do other than just by running it and seeing what happens. And the question is, how do we find sort of pockets of reducibility in the world where we can operate in such a way that we can predict something about what's going to happen? But I guess my question would be, if we're trying to describe brains at the level of individual neurons, I'm sure that there's plenty of computational irreducibility in brains. Yet, there is some collective thing that happens in brains that is somehow predictable and, and, and useful, so to speak. Right, um, right. And, and so my question is, what, uh, when, when we see that level of brains that is beyond the computationally irreducible, that is these layers, you know, these pockets of reducibility, in physics, the thing we've realized is the pockets of reducibility that we know, they're basically three statistical mechanics, general relativity, and quantum mechanics. And now we actually understand how all three of those, they're actually all pretty much the same. They all work the same way. And they're all the fact that 
you know, in statistical mechanics, the validity of the second law of thermodynamics is a consequence of the fact that we don't trace how each individual molecule moves. We only know these collective facts about it. That's why we think entropy increases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So th this is, you know, what physics has done is to identify these pockets of reducibility in what would otherwise be a completely computationally irreducible sort of, uh, you know, uh, fabric of, of what's going on. Now, the question would be, in the case of brains, it's pretty clear that we're making use of, you know, in the way that brains operate, okay, when we see our image recognition system, our object recognition system running, we can look at it down at the lowest level. We can, we can see what's happening to the individual neurons, whether it's in an artificial neural net or real neural net. And that's very complicated, and it's kind of a computationally irreducible story. But yet, the overall picture of, oh, I don't know, the things evolving to some attractor or some such other thing, there seems to be an overall picture that is beyond the level of just those individual neurons. Now, maybe the only thing about that picture is just to say there are attractors. There's some, you know, maybe that's the, maybe that's the best we can do is to say things work. But I think that's a, that's a rather static, you know, the fact there are attractors doesn't get you kind of dynamic reinforcement learning-y type things. That's just a, a fairly static statement. But my question would be, I mean, I would say one thing that maybe is a, is a thing that's come out of the neural net world um, is one sort of generic fact about the brain is this idea of attractors and basins of attraction. That's something that transcends the details of individual neurons and is a robust general idea about how brains might work. So, I mean, I, my question would be, is there, is there a, another level of that, perhaps a more yeah, dynamic okay. level? So, so uh, it, it, it turns out that what uh, the, 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 those issues that you just raised are ones that are being uh, analyzed. Um, it, and uh, by the way, uh, way beyond uh, you know, the static attractors, now we have line attractors where you know, there, it's an un, there's a whole s line of stable network configurations, right? Say a circle. Uh -huh. uh, that's been found in the brain. And interestingly, even in the fly brain. Uh, and then there are uh, dynamical attractors. Uh, that is to say, if you record from enough neurons, say in the hippocampus, well, a mouse is doing some task, like the, making a decision to go right or left. I won't go into the details. Uh, it turns out that <clears throat> even though individual neurons are doing different things, if you, if you look at the subspace that, that those neurons are going through over time, they're very constricted to a little tube. So this is like effectively dimension reduction. You, you record from all these neurons and then you do some kind of dimension reduction. Right. And try exactly. and see where, where the thing lives in some, some yeah, space. Yeah, and, and the beauty is that on any given trial, it's gonna take a different trajectory through that tube. And if you were just looking at the neurons, it would, you wouldn't know this. You would just say that they're doing, the neurons are doing different things on different trials, right? But somehow, if you have a big enough picture of the, 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 the whole space, then the, 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 you, know, the subs, you can see that this, the, the brain is carving subspaces within those that much, much larger numbers of, of, of dimensions that where the behavior lives. The behavior is a very restricted subset, subspace. Okay, but so one way of saying that is, you know, we're talking about symbolic versus neural type things. Basically, as soon as you say there are attractors, that's kind of symbolizing the, you know, the underlying neural net idea. Right. And so now the question is, when you have that, that structure, you know, so you've got the individual neurons and they're doing their thing. And what you're saying is the description of the brain might be purely at the level of the attractors, not at the level of the individual neurons. Now, the, the question will be, what's the analogy of that? In statistical mechanics, I suppose, the, um, the analogy would be, you don't care about the individual molecules, you only care about the aggregate fluid, fluid velocity or something. And this is a little different in the case of attractors. You're saying that the, the um, uh, you're not saying that the, the thing you might have said, which people talked about, you know, in sort of the early days of thinking about uh, neuronal networks and things, you might have said, all we'll do is look at the average activity. And we'll say, 
the average activity is this, and we can get you know waves from that and all kinds of things like this. That that level, which would be the level that we would do in statistical mechanics, where we would say, let's not look at the individual velocity vector of every molecule, let's only look at the aggregate velocity vector. That's kind of the analog of saying, let's not look at the individual activity of every neuron, let's just look at the average activity. So that would be kind of level zero of what people were doing in neuro, you know, neurophysiology and so on. Right. Now, what you're saying is uh, look at, not at the level of just aggregate activity, but at some attribute, which is essentially the dimension reduction of the, the, the actual neuron firing pattern. And you're saying, instead of, instead of doing the reduction, instead of just saying, take the average activity, that's the, that's the coarse grained measurement, Instead, you're saying, imagine a different kind of coarse grain measurement where the coarse graining is done by some dimension reduction method and where that is your way of describing what's happening in the system. And so that would be, so then what you, the, then the obvious question would be, uh, just like you could derive PDEs or something for the average activity, what would be the type of, uh, of theory that you would get for this kind of, um, uh, for the the kind of um, the you know the the dimension reduced representation of the brain, what will be the aggregate theory of the dimension reduced uh, structure of the brain? What would you imagine is kind of the um, uh, so? In other words, we've got we, you've got your tube of your your mouse in in yeah. because what you're effectively describing there is right. the you know you're describing that in a in some kind of uh, abstract conceptual space. You're not saying the average velocity vector. You're saying this much more complicated dimension reduced thing, where there is an abstract right. represent. You know, the, it's in an abstract space. And now the question is, what is the um, uh, you know what's the dynamics of those collective things in that abstract space? So, so the part of mathematics that comes closest to describing what we've been saying in words is manifold embedding. So the, yeah, I, I take it that there's you know, whole area that where people have come up with descriptions, mathematical descriptions for this kind of well, assuming you have a manifold, which is not obvious. I mean, the, the fact that you know what you're saying is if this dimension reduction thing, if if the aggregate variables can be described as things that live in manifolds, then so be it. That's not self-evident that that would be the case. It could be still be true. I mean, for example, in um, in the case of in, in what we've looked at in our physics project, the case of space-time, yes, you have manifolds. The case of quantum mechanics, you have Hilbert spaces. Things are more complicated. It's not a traditional kind of manifold-like structure that's locally like Euclidean space. So it's not. I think self-evident that a an aggregate description of something like this should you know, should be, I mean, space in its Euclidianized form is, is something that, uh, you know, happens to be a good description of physical space. It's not at all obvious that that would be a good description of neural space, so to speak. I mean, it, it um, uh, and it might be that neural space is more like some kind of Hilbert space type thing or, or some other structure that doesn't have kind of the, this specific idea of, of manifolds. I mean, once you have manifolds, I agree, you have PDEs and things like this. But I, I suppose the question would be, you know, you're saying you've done dimension reduction, you've got some kind of pseudo symbolic description. So what one question would be, when you do that dimension reduction, do you do the things that you dimension reduce to, are they things for which we have a sort of symbolic linguistic description of what's going on? Or are they new kinds of constructs that we haven't yet had science to talk about? Uh, I mean, not clear, not clear, because we. This is what I'm describing to you is research that's been done just in the last couple of years, and these new re dimensionality reduction methods are very advanced. You can't just PCA it to get them. You have you have to basically patch it together from local linear embeddings. So it, it's it's a complicated business. But, right, but as soon as you're doing local linear embeddings, you're assuming manifolds, basically. Yeah, but that assume. we're absolutely assuming a manifold, and, and it seems to hang together. You know, whether that's the best description, uh, who knows? It's, it's early days, but uh, but it I think it, it strikes me as explaining a lot of mysteries. And if it, if it works out, then I think it will be something that we could build on. 
But let's let's play back a different thing. So you said, you know, one of the things that was discovered in sort of the Hubert Weasel time um, was um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the feature, the fact that our visual cortex picks out certain features of a visual scene. Okay, so the question is, you're looking at the innards of a, of a deep learning neural net, and it's picked out various kinds of features and so on. The question is, what, you know, is there a form of sensory, uh, a form of, of perception that is the relevant perception for understanding the innards of a neural net? Just like that electroreceptive shark or whatever is, is sensing certain aspects of the world that are different from the ones that we're sensing, we are not usually interested in the innards of how brains work. But were we to, uh, you know, do neuroscience, for example, we might be interested in the innards of how brains work. And the question would be, what is the, uh, you know, what are the feature detectors that the evolved neuroscientists should have, so to speak, that give you sort of the relevant features for describing the innards of how brains work? What would those, and what you're saying is, these dimension reduction techniques are effectively being, are attempting to be the feature detectors for the evolved neuroscientists, so to speak. Right, um, right. And uh, so it's not obvious that those feature detectors, I mean, the, the question would be, uh, is, is there something that can be said if, I mean, how would you characterize those feature detectors? Are those feature detectors things that we, you know, is it the case, for example, with brains? Here's a, here's a possibility. It could be there are five new ideas. Okay, when we think about vision, there are things like, oh, we recognize edges, we deal with center surround cells, we have blobs, we, you know, there's a certain number of things that we would describe even in human language to say, what is the scene like? Oh, it has these straight edges, it has this geometrical structure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have a, a limited lexicon with which we describe visual scenes. So it could be the case, perhaps, that if we knew just five new concepts that we could describe the typical innards of a typical, uh, you know, heavily, uh, you know, trained neural net. And is that a plausible thing? And if that was the case, what might those concepts be? I mean, because in other words, it's not self-evident as you were mentioning, for example, for the shark, it's not, you know, for us with the visual feet, with visual scenes, things like edge detectors, makes sense because our world consists of objects that have edges. It is not self-evident that our world should consist of objects that have edges. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the trees behind you don't have very convincing edges in many ways. Um, you know, we can approximate them roughly by edges, but, but that's, so in other words, we've, you know, for our typical built environment, so to speak, the concept of having an edge detector works pretty well. You know, if you're a shark, it's not obvious that the, um, you know, the edge detector thing is necessarily the point in the, you know, if magnetic fields are what you're right. sensing, you know, edges may not be the story. So my question would be, if, you know, from your sort of life in neuroscience, so to speak, if you were to imagine what are the edges of kind of, um, uh, you know, what are the features that you would think of extracting when you look at the innards of a, of a deep learning neural net and what it's doing, which are potentially analogous to the things you've been doing single cell recording on in brains and so on, perhaps. Um, what, uh, you know, what, what might be, can you, can you guess anything about what might be the kind of descriptive concepts of the analog of edges in, you know, sort of the innards of how brains are working? Well, uh... I think starting with deep learning networks is giving us a toehold. Um, so, you know, real brains are so highly evolved that, you know, it's hard to really uh, sort out the, the kind of the principles and essential parts from a lot of details that are just there to make it work. Although I think everything, all of that is going to ultimately be important for understanding it. But but, uh, but at least in our deep learning networks, we can begin to make progress. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I can tell you a, a couple of things. Uh, so David Cicillo did a really nice analysis. He, he took simple tasks uh, having to do with accounting. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details, but uh, you know, and, and, by, and, and parody and things like that. And trained up recurrent networks to um, 
to do them, right? So simple uh, de uh, decisions on the basis of inputs coming in sequentially. And it turns out that each network was trained up and had different connections, right? And then what he did was analyze the, the, the dynamics in just the way you described. And it turns out that all of these networks had the same number of attractors in them. And when you looked at the activity pattern, it was always between the attractors in the same order in all the different networks, right? So that gives you a geometric description uh, of, of, a, of a class of simple problems where, it, it, where there's a universality here, where it, you transcend the details of individual neurons and, and can describe the algorithm that was discovered as, as this dynamics between different waypoints in the network to get you to the right output. So th that, that may be a beginning, right? That's kind of the first step. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I mean, so, so one of the questions would be, you know, like in our symbolic language that, um, you know, there are particular kinds of things one thinks about doing, you know, you have functions, you compose functions together, things like that. One of the things that is a very practical issue for us right now is, you know, we have this way of very nice symbolic way of describing neural nets in terms of essentially graphs that define the connection of layers and things like this. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, the question is, is there a, a higher level of description that is more like uh, kind of our traditional symbolic language or are we, you know, uh, kind of what, uh, I mean, the, the thing I'm, I'm sort of grappling with is, you know, what is functional programming like for uh, a neural net kind of thing? That is, what are the, what are the kinds of symbolic constructs that get you uh, further down into the, uh, you know, not to the machine code of right. individual neurons, but what are the kind of larger scale structures that get well, you? Well, I, I, I've already alluded to one of them, which is attention, right? So for more complex problems and the one I described, which is, you know, looking at the uh, sequences of, of inputs coming in and deciding whether they're odd or even or something like that, um, you need to be able to select. And, and this is something that comes natural to us, you know, when we look around, but also internally, uh, you know, you can only focus on one thing at a time, right? And, and words come out one at a time. So there's gotta be some way to take this very highly parallel distributed representation yeah. and then generate sequences. Right. This is exactly the same story as my application of consciousness. It is a sequentialization in time. It is going right. from this multi-computational system to right. something which is a single thread. Now, That's actually, right. that idea of sequentializing, you know, in our models of physics, that's done with reference frames. That's done with describing, you know, the reference frames taken by the observer. Now, interestingly, quantum mechanics is a story of the, the scars that you get from the fact that it isn't in fact sequentialized. So in other words, that, that there is actually a, a, a multi-way structure. And so the question would be, when we think about brains and even the psychology of brains, you know, is it the case that we can see kind of the, the kind of the, the scars, the shadows of the fact that what's happening isn't in fact truly sequentialized? The fact that there isn't just a single thread of attention, the fact that there could be some right some parallelization of attention is that, because that's an example of something where if one could make a theory that talks about, you know, there's usually the single thread, that would be like the classical physics, but actually there is also the possibility that there are these, these you know, these, these signs of the multi-way structure, so to speak, going on as well, then that would be, then one would end up with something, you know, there would be a Planck's constant for the brain basically. Right. Right, right. It's something okay. where there's a, a deviation from perfect classicality, single attention thread. So is right. there a Planck's right. constant for the brain? Okay, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but but it, it just remind, you reminded me of um, a very peculiar illusion. Uh, it's called a flash lag illusion. Okay, uh, flash lag, uh, 
is is a uh, illusion in which you have uh, uh, the illusion in which uh, you're trying to you you have a uh, an annulus that's fixed and you have moving spot and it, uh-huh. it, it and, and it flashes exactly in the middle of the annulus and, but it's moving through it right you don't see you do not see the flash in the middle of the annulus you see it displaced so that, that's a case where you're 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 breaking down reality because the reality is that it flashed in the middle and you do not perceive it that way right so there's something there's a mismatch between what your brain is reporting and what's really there and um, and, and and so the, the the theory was and this is a very plausible theory that well when something's moving along uh, you're predicting where it's going to be it's moving so you predict ahead and that's what you see it's, it looks like it's a little bit ahead okay so uh, you know about 15 years ago I had a postdoc who did an experiment which proved that that was wrong it's a very simple experiment uh, and here's here's what you do uh, you have the same spot coming along and it flashes just like in the normal flash lag effect but instead of continuing to move forward, it goes backwards. It reverses. Now, the prediction theory states that it should, you should see it as if it were advancing, right? Because you're making a prediction based on the input right. coming in at that moment. But what we what we showed, this was published in science, was that no, you don't see that. You see it actually going in the opposite direction. Right? The, the thing is now, you know. To, to the to the opposite side, not the side it was going, but the opposite side, which is the side it actually went. Okay, so what this tells us, okay, and this is what you know got into science, is that the brain is not in the business of predicting; it's in the business of postdicting. <laughs> it's telling, it's reconstructing something on the basis of what you see now, basis on the basis of what comes in later. Well, so is it in fact the case that if you asked somebody in real time, what are you seeing in real time relative to what was what the stimulus? I mean, it could be that what people remember seeing is not what they actually saw in real time, so to speak. That is that the formation of the thought lags the um, the actual stimulus. Is right. that a possibility? It, 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 you, that this is where things get murky, it, which has to do with uh, that you're always asking the person to tell you after the fact what they saw, right? Right. And so how, how can you probe what they actually saw? And so now it gets even more murky. Okay, so now you go into the brain and say, can, can we sort it out by recording from the neurons? And what you, what you find is that <laughs> there are neurons that first of all have different latencies even in the same area of the cortex, the ones in the top will have different latencies from the time it takes for the information to first spike to get there and from the bottom to the top. And then different areas in the hierarchy have different latencies and also different spiking patterns. In other words, there isn't any single time for perception. If you look at the level of the neurons, there are neurons that are being activated at many different times in different parts of the hierarchy. And, 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 and somehow you, reduce that to a percept. You reduce that to a single report, right? That's the mystery. And I think it's very similar to what you've described, which is that you at the micro level, it, it, there's all kinds of s- threads that, that are streaming through different parts of the cortex with different del- delays. And, but somehow that gets collapsed to your percept. And that's what we don't know. We don't right. know. How- but so, so the analogy one might expect is, you know, from what we now understand about physics, the fact that there is a definite sort of thread of activity that is classical physics is something closely connected to the fact that our, you know, we sequentialize things when we view what's happening in the world. Um, And in fact, you know, as I mentioned, there's this sort of shadow that is basically quantum mechanics. And um, so that, that really raises the question of are there sort of a family of effects that you can imagine in the brain that are uh, sort of essentially 
deviations from sequentiality of attention effects that are like quantum effects, so to speak, quantum in the sense of formalism, not quantum in the sense of quantum mechanics in the brain. And then the question would be what, you know, in, in that setting, what would characterize, you know, just like in, in physics, there's a fixed constant, namely Planck's constant that characterizes the amount of that uh, sort of deviation from classicality. The question would be for brains, uh, you know, what, what, is the, what is the constant of brains that, and, and perhaps it's something to do with, with what you're describing about um, uh, the, the uh, you know, these, these sort of different levels of, um, of well, I'm not sure, but, but, you know, maybe there's something that, um, well, I don't know, that, that, that's, that's um, okay, that, that's, that's for another time. That's, um, I think the, um, uh, um, well, listen, we should probably, we should probably wrap up here, but, but, um, but, but, uh, say, but, 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 but just to finish up the thought, okay, and, and I, 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 you've raised some really important issues that are not, uh, the neuroscientists kind of, sh sh you know, they, they, they naturally, because they don't really know how to instrument, you know, to, to operationalize it, they, they, they tend to stay away, like consciousness is a good example of that, not, you know, but uh, it's, I think, you're, what we're just like, consciousness is the tip of the iceberg. And there's all of these non sequential threads are going on all over the brain all the time. It's called your unconscious, right? right. You're not aware of it. You're not aware of it, but it, we know that it's important because a lot of things bubble up from, right. you know, and, and, and in the strangest times, and then you suddenly get hit by a thought, where did it come from? Well, it must've come from the brain somewhere, right? <laughs> Some thread suddenly got promoted. Uh, in, in any case, I, I think that it's, it's a good, you have a good way of, of describing uh, the mysteries of where we, we're at. Right. right. I mean, I think the thing that I'm really curious about is, you know, imagine sometime in the future when there is, you know, it's like for many different fields, physics is the unique case where people have global theories. That's a, that's a you know, it's a place where they don't exist in economics. They don't exist in, you know, they don't exist in neuroscience. What would, what would one imagine? What kind of a discussion would there be about the global theory of neuroscience? And, um, you know, I think that's the, that's the thing that, you know, what kind of, because for, for example, in physics, it's not obvious the measurements that one chooses to do about which there are reasonable physical laws, it's not obvious what those measurements should be. And so similarly for neuroscience, I don't think it's necessarily obvious. You know, it could be as soon as you start looking at you know, the dimension reduced, you know, activity of the neurons or whatever else, it will become kind of obvious that, uh, you know, the brain works in this way, but we just didn't look at the right features to be able to sort of see the obvious theory, so to speak. Um, and so I, I guess I'm curious. I mean, I do think that some of the formalism that we've, okay, so the big bizarre thing that's happened with our model of physics is because we have this underlying machine code model of physics, so to speak, and that uh, the fact that we can relate it to physics, which has achieved a lot as a field, means that if we can take that same machine code and apply it in other areas, we get to leverage everything that physics has discovered. So, I mean, for example, in, in your life, you know, working on, um, uh, you know, from physics to neuroscience, I'd be curious to know, you know, the things you learned in physics studying black holes and gravitational radiation and things like this, you know, what have you used in neuroscience? I mean, you've used, you know, some amount of differential equations, no doubt. Um, but a lot of what you learned in physics, you have not been able to transport to neuroscience, I suspect. You know, the, the, the theory of deep learning systems is mostly not a theory that you were able to transport from physics. The surprise now from some of what we're doing is that, that the, some of the formalism that we're getting from this sort of machine code from physics is if we can use the same machine code, that higher level formalism is transportable. But I'm, I'm curious actually that the-, the it, it, You know, it, it, it might happen. I, I, you know, going to your issue of, you know, what have I used from physics? It's not 
specific, uh, it's the tools. It's, it's right. the kind of the, 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 the uh, mathematics really uh, that yeah, right. has been the most effective uh, for it. But a, a particular theory for magnetism that hasn't translated, you know, it, it, unless right. you're looking but, at- But even the mathematics, you know, right. when you look at your average deep learning network and you say, I'm gonna bash this thing on a GPU, there's not a heck of a lot of math of the traditional kind used in physics that tells you what's going to happen. Well, uh, I, you know, okay, so, you know, it, it, this is uh, what people call explainability. You know, uh, can you explain it? And, and, and the answer is not yet, but lo let's look at protein folding, right? This is like a holy grail in biology. And, you know, it, 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 it everybody is shocked that they, that this that that the, you know deep learning and you know deep mind was able to achieve performance levels on new proteins you know, new sequences that approach uh, x-ray crystallography i mean you know it's it's shocking because this is the classic problem of irreducibility right everybody thought that you'd never be able to to fold a protein without actually doing the the, the mechanics of, of, of simulating the differential equations to get there. Well, I think the question is, insofar as there are many postage stamps of proteins, so to speak, many distinct, you know, uh, the question is, is the space interpolatable? That is, is, the, is it the case that the, you know, that the complexity of the space is uh, such that with a limited number of postage stamps, you can successfully interpolate? I mean, I think that's so. the... Apparently so. Apparently yeah, so. Another, right. In other words, uh, the, the number of possible protein sequences is in, almost infinite, and oh, the ones that are actually seen are a relatively small subset. Well, that's a whole different question about whether the proteins that we actually use are random proteins or not. I looked at that um, several yeah. times now, and I, I've been I've been kind of using that. It's when I run into somebody who knows about proteins. That is my standard question: is Do you think? that the proteins used by biology are randomly chosen or not? Um, well, you know, there, there's a lot of different answers to the question, but you, what you see is motifs that are used over and over again. And it turns out that there are substitutions you can make that don't change the function. So, you know, it, right. it's, it's a complicated answer. But, but, but something like an alpha helix is, is very generic. I mean, you, once you have, you know, just by the, by the physics of, of protein structure, right. you're gonna right. get alpha helices. Yeah, That's alpha helices, beta thing. sheets, so are these secondary structures that are very prototypical that are found over and over again in all proteins. And it's pretty clear that, that that's kind of part of the answer is that, you know, you have different scales with which you put together. Right. But, but again, we're talking about, you know, in protein space, what are the relevant features? But, and one thing is, oh, you've got an alpha helix, you've got a beta sheet, um, as opposed to I just yeah. you've got the, and so, I mean, I, but there's got to be more, and I'll tell you why. Because of the fact that the protein has to have other features that are not as obvious, that allow it to be robust, to keep it folded, and to allow it to flex in certain ways, you know, to uh, bind to a particular spot. In other words, there's a lot of other things that the protein has to do to be viable, and and that's they're not obvious, right? That's the point. Right. Well, but I, but, but but yes, but right. But once you have evolved proteins that have certain attributes. The question is, do you have enough postage stamps to fill in? Yeah, you know? and, and apparently the answer is yes. Right, right, which but, is not know, obviously- And, and, and that, that may be uh, the, the biggest discovery, right? Because again, it, it wasn't obvious. Right, and, and perhaps it, as you suggest, it points the way to kind of, uh, you know, in a sense, if we were to describe proteins, we have only certain features we know about like alpha helices and so on, perhaps there's really, a different level of description. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, one of the points of right. science is to say, oh, of all these complicated things that's going on, you know, is there some particular describable feature that we can attribute to things that we can then reason in terms of? You know, can we make a symbolic reduction effectively right. Right. of this collection of, of, of disparate kinds of actual yeah, yeah. Okay. Ex Explainability, I, I, my, my guess is that it will come, but not in the form of words, it will come in the form of mathematics. There'll be mathematical structures, maybe manifolds. Well, that's a question, right? Whether it's traditional mathematics or whether it's computational.
Uh, uh, okay, okay, I, I, I completely accept that. That you know, it, there may be a computational abstraction that could right. serve as the explanation, but it's, right. uh, but it's probably more. It's going to be very complex. By the way, I think we've gone beyond the hour and a half. And yeah, I, yeah, right. We have, and okay, we should wrap okay, up. But no, it's been I, fun. But I, 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 before we leave, I have to remind you, Stephen, because you reminded me that you played a very important role in naming my book, you know, the Deep Learning Revolution. I see in the shelf behind you a new kind of science. Uh huh. And I want to remind you of a discussion we had because you, at one point, wanted to call it having to do with complexity, so, something or another, right? Uh huh. And yeah, I probably and I, have. I probably have behind me. I probably have the previous version, which was called the science of complexity. Yes. Okay. And I think it was Beatrice and I who convinced you that that probably was a generic title that you didn't want, right? Well, I'll tell you one of the market study points. I mean, I remember talking about this, but one of the market study points was if you say, I've got a book that's called The Science of Complexity, the next question people ask is, the next thing people say is that sounds very complicated. If you have a book, <laughs> where, where the name is a new kind of science, right. people say the first question they ask is what's new about it, which is, um, I mean, it is amusing that, that, you know, the title of that book is, you know, people are like, they, you know, as, you know, it's now nearly 20 years since I wrote that book. And uh, you know much about you know the basic computational paradigm that I tried to describe there has become pretty commonplace actually during that period of time, and people are like uh, you know uh, the the uh, they're, they're like what was the book about? And it's it's like and eventually you realize that people say well you know uh, you realize well well what it was was described by the actual title of the book, which is a new kind of science, so to speak. And people, people seem sort of uh, a bit shocked that actually, you know, when you loop back to it, that was, was actually the right title. I think that um, another thing I, I, to comment on, on, on one of your, your comments to me in, in sort of developing that new kind of science is, uh, you know, what is its relationship to physics, for example? And I think, you know, I think I can uh, attribute to you the claim you know, why don't you just do a leveraged buyout of physics, so to speak? Why don't you make <laughs> the future of physics be that new kind of science? What's charming about that is at the time, my statement was the institutions of physics, it's too difficult to work with them. It's much easier just to build our own, so to speak. The irony of that story is with what we've now figured out about physics, it turns out that that is sort of happening because the, the, you know, the type of thinking that goes into new kind of science is the underlying part of the type of thinking that's gone into this, uh, this you know, new approach to physics, which it turns out plugs in very nicely to lots of things that people are thinking about in physics. So in the end, that, I wouldn't call it a leverage buyout of physics, but in the <laughs> end, this kind of uh, you know, redefinition of what, what, it, what one should be studying in physics. You know, in other words, if you're, you know, what, what kinds of modeling methodologies should you use? Um, you know, it's, it's actually happening. But I think, um, uh, you know, you, you just, we'd, we'd sort of looped around to this point about um, explainability and what, um, uh, you know, and having, um, and, and sort of how you, how you do those kinds of things. I'd like to point out that, you know, my main life activity of trying to define this computational language for describing the world is precisely about that. It's precisely about, can we find a symbolic description? It's not mathematics, it's a new kind of notation. I mean, the notation of mathematics is 400 years old. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is find a new, essentially computational notation for representing the world. Um, and that's, in a sense, what, what you're asking for is, what is the computational notation that's relevant for neuroscience? And yes, that was that was the original question that I thought we were going to talk about here today. And we've we've managed to talk about a bunch of aspects of that. And I, you know, I think that that, you know, what's the appropriate computational notation for neuroscience? The machine code may be neural nets, but what is the higher level sort of description? You say it might be mathematical. I, that might be the case. It might be like general relativity, which is kind of mathematical and very manifold based. Um, it might be something that is more like a computational language design problem. And, uh, you know, but that's the, that's the thing I'd love to, I'd love to be able to solve is, you know, what is the, what is the computational language description 
or the higher level description of you know what one needs to be talking about in, in neuroscience and um well, we're, we're getting, gonna have we're to getting there we're, we're, Stephen, our, our trajectories have gone in different directions but i think they're coming back together i think we have a, a, a yes. common language here to describe uh, a very complex if i may use that word systems <laughs> yes right right no i i i agree it's an interesting stuff all right we should we should wrap up here thank you very much terry this was um uh Great conversation. We covered lots and lots of different kinds of things, and um, uh, and uh, we should come back and do it again sometime in the future once once we've got the next few steps of figuring this all I out. I look forward to that. I, I had a lot of fun, and I really uh, I think that uh, you provoked me, uh, uh, you know, to really start thinking about this again, uh, going back to our early discussions. Yeah, right. Should happen. Good. Right. Sounds good. Well, thanks a lot.